OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. We've got a Whopper show lined up for you today. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Jerry Roy and Owen Sheen with you through all the way until 10 o'clock this morning. If you want to get in touch, text the show by WhatsApp 87 180 180 or you can use the hashtag OTBAM. The best place to listen to us these days is on the OTB Sports app. Just search OTB Sports in the App Store and download it there. We have Ron O'Gara coming on to talk about uh, Leinster against Saracens in the Heineken Champions Cup and a little bit of French rugby as well. We're going to hear from Ryan McMenamin and Anthony Cunningham about what it was like being back on the training field officially yesterday with uh, their charges ahead of the return of the National Football League and then ultimately, we hope, the return of the Championship proper. That's coming up around about 8.15. And then John Hartson's going to join us just after 9 o'clock to talk to us about uh, how Gary Breen has ignited a fire in Scottish football. That's going to be very interesting to see if there's a long-term impact, if maybe a little period of self-reflection happens. Who am I kidding? They just want to lump on him. Uh, we're not going to let that happen for uh, him today because he's one of our own. Anyway, uh, that's all coming up a little bit later on. In the meantime... Owen was hosting Monday Night Rugby last night with uh, Keith Wood and Roy O'Connor. Have a look. And Keith, it's eight points conceded in two games now by Leinster. Two huge games, uh, which is almost more important. It almost seems as if they're getting better in this department, that they're letting in less points in this department. Well, I, I think they are getting better. I think they, um, the more players that are getting used to the system, the more comfortable they are with the system. That makes it that makes a really big difference. And. Look, there, there are variations all the time and yet everybody else seems to know what's happening. So in this instance, it was like a bit of a throwback to Nigel Carr and I'm definitely showing my age, but where you have a seven flying at 10 and um, like Burns was under so much pressure to catch the ball and a mind pass it. And even though um, um, he got the ball away, I think virtually every time, I'd, I think he may have been caught once, um, he got the ball away, but it, mean, it meant everything was hurried. And so they were under pressure all the time. The guys outside him were under pressure. And to be able to have a guy flying out of the line like, um, like Van der Fleer was, uh, the rest of the players have to do a really good job then on the back of it because you've one guy out of it. But, so they're able to kind of decide to change different things, do things a little bit different, start putting different people under pressure. Like I thought it was a very simple game. I do think a lot of the game was like th a throwback and I love the idea that some of the things that they're bringing to the game now um, aren't new but are old but um, they worked in times past and as the laws change they work again so um, yes defensively they looked very good the the quality of the tackling two guys in on a huge number of tackles um, the only negative part of their defensive was uh, for me, Conan got penalised three times and I was looking at that. I was kind of arguing with the ref on some of them. I, I think that law is interesting, how it's been how it's been refed, but I, I actually think it would be incredibly frustrating because some of those seem to be uh, turnovers and weren't and didn't become so. But um, there was a few shakes of the head from, from Conan when he was running back, but there was a great sense of composure. So I would have said that their defence was excellent, but was incredibly simple. Yeah, like that situation you mentioned with van der Fleer flying off the line and somebody being outside him to protect the risk that that presents. How long does that take from a coaching standpoint, Keith, for Leinster to get to that level where everybody understands what to do when somebody comes off the line? I don't know if that takes a huge amount of time. It right. just goes to the coach saying, listen, this is what you're going to do, Josh, and lads, uh, business as usual behind him. So. So he's given the, the sort of uh, the get out of jail card. It doesn't matter if they step you. It doesn't matter if the ball is popped to somebody else, everybody else. We have one guy now out of the line and we're confident that the rest of the team can go and do it. So it's almost like playing with a, a guy in the sin bin. They still play with that same level of the line, but this is a very offensive manner in which to use it. So look, I just liked it because it just it's a bit different, you know, and... Um, and for me, it was a simple thing. But again, it's things of the past that are used really, really well and really effectively. So that was done 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And all you needed was one little offload. And you were 20 yards behind the opposition. You know, that didn't happen the other day because it was a very well and very comfortably organized defensive setup. And it does seem, Marie, that they've answered any questions that they've had defensively, whether it's the high-kicking game that Munster had against them in their first game. They seem to answer that pretty well. 
last week uh, at the weekend and they seem to answer pretty much all the defensive questions and it seems personnel wise they've improved even James Lowe seems less of a defensive liability not that he ever was and Hugo Keenan seems exceptional in that department too yeah I think they'll, they'll be tested more in that that department uh, next weekend when you know right. Saracens have an excellent kicking game and, and Will looks like they're going to be bringing um uh, what the, the Wigglesworth back and, and his box kicking is excellent. Their chase game is that is very good, and I think that will be somewhere Saracens look to exploit because you know Keenan for all is very good. They get cleaned out by Stockdale at one point, and Ulster maybe didn't go to the air as much as they they should have. They kind of used it more as a last resort, and um, when they were getting battered on the line. But yeah, the, like I, the big concerns they will have is their line out, and I don't think Ronan Keller can take a, like you know Keith knows more about the playing hooker than I do but I thought a lot of their communication was poor I thought they they missed lifts a couple of times they didn't even get up in the air one time Andrew Porter took the ball that's going to be a big concern because next week they're going up against the Toje so I do think those elements will be tested more as they step up in class this weekend you know they are the best team in the Pro 14 by some distance but I think that their personnel are forced to play exceptionally well every week Van der Fleer is an, ex an excellent example I don't think Josh Van der Fleer is in line to start this week I think mm -hmm. Will Connors will start this week certainly I think that's the plan and Van der Fleer's mission was not only to win the Pro 14 and he won man in a match in the final his other mission was to try and convince Stuart Lancaster and Leo Cullen that he want, that he's the man to play against Saracens this weekend um, and in, in many ways he did everything he could to do that now Connors I think is a horse for a course that he, he'll be sent out to the to stop Billy Vinopola, but you know they did a very good job, and Van der Fleer led the line in, in terms of stopping Coetzee at the weekend. So they're just every time someone is given a start or given an opportunity, they know it's a bit like the Dubs. They know that, that this is their one and only chance, and if they if they don't take it, there's someone equally good ready to take it. You know next week. So um, that's you know they just learn, they simulate and learn all the time. They're just really really good at that, and. You know, Munster showed them. Or Munster showed up a couple of areas in in game one, but didn't kind of kind of try to exploit the same areas again two weeks later. But they, they you know, they learned from that that experience, and they are improving in all of those areas, bar maybe the line out, which I think is the chief concern going into this week. Yeah, ju just on that, Keith, what what is your take on Lancer's line out? If they've managed to fix other potential issues so well, there's probably no fear of them not being able to fix this one. No, I mean, look, I, I, there's a couple of parts of it. I thought their their timing was off, so um, it was uh, it was unusual to see it being off in that fashion. So there was, I think, there was maybe four balls were were missed. Um, but as Rory said, there was no lift sometimes, or there was the wrong movement. That can be people coming back in. Um, but you don't expect it to go bad when James Ryan comes back in, you know. So. Um, uh, I can tell you that every hooker worth his salt is going to have days when it doesn't work for him. Uh, there's also days when he's not at fault for some of them. Um, but even on those days, you lose your confidence because you know who you want to throw it to and it's not happening. So, look, these are system failures. You don't want to have system failures in the final. And normally when that happens, you lose. Um, and that can happen. But um, it was it was a bit of a problem. But for me, the the... The, the most interesting or intriguing part for Leinster was um, we talked about their defence but it was because they weren't under pressure, they didn't seem to be in any harried at any stage um, they forced Ulster into, into pressurised passes into loopy passes in the back line, into players coming out of the line, on their line you know, for, for, for the try that Lowe scored at the end, you just needed to stay on your man you can't go for the ball on the line um, but it was forcing There were this is 15-20 minutes into a game where they pretty much are being battered left, right and centre and have no time at all and the pressure told on Ulster, I thought Ulster played pretty well um, I thought they made a couple of mistakes and in this instance Leinster took every opportunity so any opportunity that came their way they took with the exception of the lineouts. So, look, and even which was something I wrote down twice um, and this is why I got uh, I was really impressed by Ross Byrne his touch finders for penalties he went he, I think he took the view was if it doesn't go out it doesn't go out but he was kicking them 50, 60 yards to be 5 and 7 yards out you know, the pressure that puts on a defensive team is is incredible. And I just think Ulster never caught a break almost in the game. They were under so much pressure. Yeah, we, we'll come to Ross Byrne in just a moment. But just one last point on the line-out, Keith. How important is it 
for Leinster, how important is it for Ireland that there are just more minutes clocked up between Ronan Kelleher and James Ryan at this point from the line out? Well, it's just more time for, for Ronan Kelleher because he has to see what it's like to play under pressure. He has to understand all the different elements of it. He has to understand that the um, the hype of a final can mean that you can throw the ball about a yard further or two yards further and you have to make certain that that doesn't happen. You may not be used to it. and But it's also about getting things working really, really well. So I didn't think um, Lens were getting off the ground at times. Some of the movement didn't seem to be um, as good as it normally was and actually once they recognised that their timing was off they kind of stopped throwing it there they threw an awful lot to Conan and two just made certain that they had the ball and held the ball for a period of time so look you need all that practice but you, everybody needs to understand um, the, the movements of the players you know so um, like we're saying the timing was off I think a couple of times um, Ronan uh, Keller threw too early he saw the movement and then reacted and that's just because he doesn't quite understand the full body language of the people that's there, maybe. That's what it looked like to me. Right, well, hopefully uh, a bit more minutes in the clock and that'll uh, address some of those issues. Uh, you're listening to Keith Wood and Rory O'Connor, by the way, on Monday Night Rugby. Our rugby coverage is with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Uh, let's talk about Ross Byrne, lads. And Rory, it seems that the, Ross Byrne and Johnny Sexton are obviously going to be inextricably linked when we talk about them because of the problems that they play for. But it's around this time in Sexton's career when he became the starter for Ireland at Six Nations level anyway. Uh, how similar are those trajectories at the moment? It seems that Ross Byrne rarely if ever puts a foot wrong. Yeah, it, like Ross Byrne must must be wondering what he has to do to get a bit of positive PR. So I think he deserves it after the weekend. But I mean, he hasn't even, like he's been waiting patiently for Johnny Sexton to, to, to head off into the sunset for a couple of years. He turned down a move to Ulster when Joe Schmidt and, and David Nussifor were trying to get himself and Joey Carberry to make a move and, and, and saw off Joey Carberry at the time, who I think a lot of people thought were, was the better player, but he backed himself. And, and, and Leinster, in fairness, backed him ahead of Carberry at that number 10 role. Carberry was the 15. And he's still waiting patiently for Johnny Sexton to come through. And everyone's talking about his little brother as the, the man. Like Brian O'Driscoll has been on this this show anointing Harry, you know, who is excellent and is a flashier player and has a lot more of the kind of athletic ability, I think, to go on and be a world-class player than Ross. But Ross has a, now got a proven CV of delivering in, in a lot of very big games for Leinster, in, you know, in one of the best teams in the world. And he steps in for one of the best players in the world. And the team's performance rarely dips. And I think his game management, which is one of those slightly indefinable things that, you, you know, it's, it, there's no numbers to kind of measure it. But his he comes in and he makes the right decisions at the right time for his team. He, he His technical abilities are very, very good. As Keith mentioned, his touch finding, things like that. You know, he, he rarely makes a mistake. His goal kicking is very, very good. And his option taking, I think, is the biggest thing. I think he makes the right decision nearly all of the time. And, and that, from your number 10... You don't necessarily need a, a, a bit, you know a really flashy player who makes you know line breaks all the time. Although his running was very good at the weekend, probably better than I've seen before. I think he, he you know, he'd earned that start, um, having kind of started the semi-finals against Munster the last last year. I think he'd earned a start in a final, and you know, it, it, the, the, a measure of the job that he did was that by the time Johnny came in, really Johnny came in for a lap of honour and a twenty-minute run out for Saracens. Now he drops out of the team this week. You'd expect. But I think if anything happens to Sexton, they'll have no hesitation in sending him in because of the role that he's played in their success so far and the trust that they have in him. And while Harry is a really, really exciting player and so is Kieran Frawley, I think they've still got a fair bit of work to do because Ross has proven himself um, to be a very, very willing and hardy competitor. And I think he is Ireland's number two out half at the moment, even though he, he, he won't start the biggest games for Leinster if Sexton is fit. Uh, well, Keith, just on that then, if Sexton does stay fit, do you think that he can take that step to actually making this a legitimate contest? Because, let's face it, the reason why he started on Saturday is because Sexton was resting up for Saracens. Does it get to legitimate contest level next season, in your view? Well, I think it needs more of those um, type performances. So, um, like I disagree with Rory and say that um, I would look at Leinster when, when Ross Byrne is playing and he tends to play in an awful lot of the games that aren't finals okay he's played in a couple of semi-finals and he's done pretty well um he's done well but other players have had to do incredibly well as well i, th I still feel he sits too far back um and he didn't at the weekend so for me he he took a big step at the weekend um i think he's often defensively a little bit meek in the tackle 
he wasn't at the weekend, you know. So for me, it looked like he had he had been given the jersey and he felt he had to prove that maybe this is something that it could be his jersey going forward. I think it's a masterclass from Leo Cullen to do it. I think it's a really, really good selection. It keeps a guy on the top of his toes. And in my view, he has to start thinking that that 10 jersey, he, he wants it to be his. To do that, he needs to not play, I'm not going to say a safe game, because he's a very good player, but he needs to take control. So 10s take control. That's the um, that's all you ever want as a forward or as a player, as someone who's actually able to, to direct the, the ball around the field and the game and to do it. And I felt he did a really good job in that yesterday. So I'd agree. I think it's the best game I've seen him play. I know he's done other things and done it very well, but there was more balance to him and he got stuck in a little bit too because if he plays more at 10, if he plays closer to the line, he's going to be targeted by back rows. He has to deal with all that. He has to take those hits on his terms. Um, I would have seen that he did that a couple of times at the weekend and for me, I like I get excited because um, you know we need we need playmakers in the country and I thought for, for me, he played very well and I... I wouldn't get totally over the top excited by it because I want to see him do it again and do it again. Um, but for me, he looked like a real international 10 and um, and I thought he bossed the game. So for, the, for that, that's only good for all of us. So positionally, Keith, in previous games, you would have seen him sit a lot deeper, essentially to use ring rows or, or Henshaw as more of a protection or, or what were you seeing in the past? Just, I think a lot of the way Leinster play is that they um, um, they have the ten going back, and he'll he'll pass and he'll he'll drift, and they'll have um, forwards uh, tipping it on and rolling in around it. Um, that works because Johnny will have a cut every now and then on the gain line, and that's why he gets smashed so much, right? But but if if you don't have that attack every now and then, um, your defensive setup against you is different you know that that's not going to happen. So you tend to put more um, interest in the guys that are going to be outside him. So like, if he does it every now and then, it just keeps the guys honest. So, But you're going to take a few hits for that. He definitely did at the weekend, and he was fine. He got stuck in a fair bit. So um, like I thought that was a big step forward for him. And um, you don't get quite as nervous about Johnny getting injured then with something like that happening. Yeah, for sure, and uh, like that is the hallmark of Johnny Sexton as well, being able to step up and take the hit. Uh, Rory, we're going to be focusing a lot on Leinster Saracens this weekend, but this weekend is also a huge opportunity for Ulster, kind of in a similar way that last weekend was an opportunity for them as well. They're 11 points underdogs for the game against Toulouse this weekend. How did they take what they learned from being a massive underdog last weekend and put it into an effort to actually try and win as a massive underdog this weekend? It's going to be difficult for them. I, I, you know, I... I think Ulster remain in a kind of a category below Leinster and probably Toulouse as well. You know, I think they have some very good players. I think the fact that Ian Henderson now has 50 minutes under his belt is is important for them. I think, you know, I don't think he was able to impact the game. And, and I think Ryan was the same. I think they'll both benefit for the fact that they play, but they weren't at their best. You know, that's the Ireland second row pairing from the last, the last World Cup. And, they, you know, they weren't as influential as you'd expect because they're just back from injuries. That will help. You know, Cotia was taken off after 53 minutes. Maybe there's a lesson there. Don't you know they can't be as reliant on him with ball in hand as they have been. Um, I think they need to like they need to learn to take their their chances. Like Keith mentioned a couple of errors. I, I, like even the fact that Burns misses the conversion you, against a team like Leinster or in, in a European quarter final away to Toulouse, you can't spurn those two points. You gotta you gotta build the score when it's there. You, you, you can't give penalties away off kickoff every time. You know, do, do, like, every time that there was a kickoff. I think it was that the John Andrew came on for Rob Herring and he gave away at least one, anyway, maybe two off kickoff that allowed Leinster just to get immediate field position. And, and against Toulouse, you're playing against some of the most dangerous players in the world. You're also playing against one of the biggest packs going in the game. And, and I know they won't have a big crowd behind them, but there will be, you know, the, away from home in France, you can't hand teams like, like these, like, you know, Leinster Saracens, Toulouse, Claremont, Rassing. Um, a pretty, you know, that's that's the cream of the crop at the moment. And, and if you're Ulster, you need to be perfect. And and while they were very good on Saturday and did a lot right and scored early and and scored a beautiful try, and James Hume looks like a real player, um, you just can't make as many errors as, as they did. And and if they make even half the errors on, on Sunday, they're going to be in trouble against Toulouse because Toulouse will punish them. So I wouldn't have a huge amount of hope for them. I think eleven points sounds about right. Um. But they've proven the ability to, to show up and play in these big games before. They've, they've shown a bit of character in the last couple of weeks as well. 
and they're improving. And I think they, they showed a lot more than the Munster did the previous week against Leinster. But at the same time, they finished 22 points off them. So they're still on, they're, they're more on the kind of, they're on an upward curve, but they're still quite down on that curve, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and that's a kind of an interesting compare and contrast, Keith, the idea that they went for more of a higher tempo game, whereas we previous Munster perhaps box kicked a hell of a lot more than they did. Do you think that Ulster are on a, a better path to try and take down Leinster over the next little while? And, and I'm talking stylistically here. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure right. with that. I mean, I was very frustrated with Munster's performance because they didn't. Um, they didn't fire a shot, and yes, it kept them close. But um, um, it has to be more than that because uh, Munster have a bad um, record against Leinster at the moment, so that doesn't work. Um, and you can't be looking for consolation in the score when you lose. But um, for me, uh, Ulster were. Uh, like they scored the try, it was a great try. They played with a huge amount of pressure um, themselves uh, in the sort of middle of the field, but they gave up their scores very easily. And they were there are things you can't do. So you have to make teams really work for the score. And it's not the end of the world if they score, but if guys, if a winger runs in without a hand going on him, that's like that's heartbreaking because they had to work very hard to get theirs and. You know, then they struggled pretty much for the rest of it. And every time they made a mistake, and Rory, you mentioned it, I mentioned it, but you, you give away a penalty on a kickoff and uh, Ross Byrne in the form he was in kicks it 65 yards to the five metre line out, you're back under pressure again. So, um, you know, that's the, I mean, that's the nature of them. They're not used to having been up at that level either. So it's... Um, they're a very good team. They're away from home. I wonder whether Toulouse will be confused by the lack of noise because um, you know some of the some of the matches have gone against the home team in France over the last week or two. Um, so if that were to continue, that'd be great because normally they depend so much and live off the energy that comes from the crowd. So if it, it's a good chance and an opportunity for them, but they have to be patient themselves in defence. Um, and they have to be patient with attack and they have to take every opportunity to score. Um, it's hard for, for some of the teams, and you're right, Rory, I think that some of the teams are on a higher level um, and playing against them means you're under huge pressure yourself to not make a mistake and that can be disturbing and you're under huge pressure to take every opportunity and uh, that's huge pressure as well. So I think there is a bit of a gap at the moment between some of the teams in Europe um, Ulster definitely not at that top table um, but that doesn't mean that they don't get a win away but I think they'd be very lucky to win Yeah for sure uh, just to tie up the, the Pro 14 conversation then Rory I think your piece in the Sunday Independent yesterday opened with a line that we need not take off the blue ribbons from the Pro 14 trophy at this point it is Leinster's uh, every single year in terms of Irish sport at large where does this Leinster team rank in your view of the most dominant Irish sports teams that we've had? Oh, God. I mean, there, there are massive parallels with the current Dublin team, I think. I mean, they haven't quite gone for as long. And it, this is a new team, really, if you look at the personnel. It's changed since, um, you know, probably the team that won in Bilbao. It's, it's kind of the Stuart Lancaster era. But they have... I just don't see anyone in this competition, anyway, closing the gap to them in the next couple of years. So we talk about Munster and Ulster trying to close the gap on them, but it's a moving target. And, and like, I think they're trying to catch up with a bullet train at the moment. And it's, it's, it, it's so, so difficult. They've got such a, an array of talent. The system is perfectly built on top of that kind of gold mine of, 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 um, of players coming through and they're just set up to succeed. And, and, you know, I think we're only seeing, we're only at the midpoint of this era of Leinster success. I think this is kind of maybe, you know, Leinster 2.0, maybe even 3.0. I'm not sure. If you think that this, this success started in 09, they had a bit of a dip around 2016 and they've come back even stronger. Um, they're very, very impressive at the moment and they're only going to get better. But, you know, the, they measure themselves in, in this competition coming this weekend. I think that winning the Pro 14 is easy for them at the moment. You know, it's, it's still an achievement and it, you don't want to undermine the effort that went in from 53 players across the season and, and the players for whom, you know, Saturday was, was a special day. But... You know, there's four stars in that jersey. They talk a lot about earning a fifth. I think if they lose the Saracens, they won't really re reflect very happily on this season at all. Uh, I think they test themselves on European success. If they win five trophies out of six in the last three seasons, that's a pretty good uh, endorsement of where what they've been doing for the last couple of years. And the way the, the draw has left them in Dublin for the next two weeks, 
if they you know if they can get themselves into a final, it'd be hard to get bet against them. And even the fact that Farrell's suspended and the you know Saracens are missing loads of lads, they have a very good chance of doing that. So yeah, I think their dominance is pretty impressive. I, I don't see anyone in the Pro 14 challenging them really for the next. You know, someone could catch them on an off day, but I think they're so far ahead of everyone else in that competition. It's really in the next two weeks where they'll be properly tested, and we'll get a good measure of where they are historically and kind of where they are on the kind of a European scale. But you know, right now they're looking pretty good. Uh, last word to you, Keith. Uh, does that concern you, even from a neutral standpoint, that the Pro 14 has become so easy for Leinster? I, I think that happens in, in a lot of competitions, rarely for three or four years, you know. Um, but uh, it's it's a concern. But you look at what you want is excellence. So what we're getting is excellence. Mm. So um, what you're trying to say to the other teams, and especially to the other teams on this island, uh, you need to up your game. And... There is an element of luck needed, by the way. Um, Leinster can get away with a bit because they've got huge strength and depth. But for Munster, the injuries take a huge toll on, on um, uh, almost like a disproportionate effect uh, for, for Munster and for Ulster. Um, but uh, you, this, this is the standard. All you want is a standard setter and you have to follow it and meet it. And so if anybody's looking for the goal, it's there in front of them all the time. And it's, uh, will Leinster be able to sustain that? I think they can sustain it, uh, but I don't think everything is lost. But you have to have a look at how you're doing things and you have to do things better. And you need to bring more players to the, to the game because at the present moment in time, I don't think... Um, I don't think either Ulster or Munster are getting enough of their players through the system um, of the quality that is needed. So they're the sort of things that have to change. Now, they that might be three, four, five-year um, um, vista to get those players through. But on the same token, you have to make a start. And uh, like both those teams need far more strength and depth than they, they currently have. And they need to be able to trust the guys that they have there. Um, so that's that's the target. There's a target on Leinster and there's a target on those teams to make certain that their players from their own province can get there. So, um, look, it's easier said than done, but you can see what you have to do. So um, I think Leinster have to enjoy where they are at the moment because um, I think it's a very stable uh, um, management. It is a very stable amount of quality players coming through all the time. And that's, that's a fairly potent mix. Is it going to be a Pro 14 Champions Cup double for Leinster, Keith? Uh, I think they're big favourites to, to beat Saracens at the, at the weekend. I think Saracens are they're still very good, but they're not the same without, without some of their players. Um, I expect them to win at the weekend, and after that, we'll, we'll discuss the final um, after that one. Don't make too many early, early calls on that yet. Do, do you go along with Rui's assertion, actually, that this could be a little bit of... Uh, to fly in the ointment if you look back on Leinster season without getting the Saracens job done this weekend that they will look back on it with an air of regret I think they're a winning team mm. they'll be absolutely peeved if they don't win you know they, they, they need to win that's what they're set up for and, um, and they have everything at their disposal but that doesn't mean you win so they need to go out and have a proper performance I think they win at the weekend I, I actually think they're too strong for Saracens um, with the um, the people that have left Saracens and um, uh, when it gets to a final it depends finals are different and you can go out and play very well and lose you definitely won't be happy with it but it's not the same as then you write off the season if that happens but look I think they're favourites for it at the moment um, and it depends what happens at the weekend and how they play but uh, they can't they can't they can't actually be thinking about the final they can only think about the weekend all right, you've been listening to Keith Wood and Rory O'Connor on Monday Night Rugby. Thanks, lads. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Looking for a football show with a bit of a twist? Too much you like, I see. It's supposed to be the same as forgetting teams playing together and teamwork and fitness and all that. And he said, would there be an addition here? I said, it might be, can't say no to anyone. The next minute, Mick won't explode. It will be really little litter down to, you know, everything. Now you're next, an expert on things. And uh, Jack, the tears started running down Jack's cheek. You know what I mean? He was in fits of laughing. The very best interviews with the cult heroes of the past and a look at the cultural side of football. Team 33, live at 9 p.m. every Friday on OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. 
The Premier League is back on off the ball with two live and exclusive commentaries every Sunday. First time ball into the back post to Salah. Oh, what a save! And it's in! Liverpool have scored! And the best analysis around for Brian Kerr, Kenny Cunningham, Damian Delaney and John Giles. He's real. There's no bullshit with Johnny Giles. We've got the football show weeknights from nine, live goals every Saturday from one and the biggest games every Sunday. That's the Premier League, live and exclusive on OTB Sports Radio. Football on Off the Ball with Paddy Power, fueling the mischief in the beautiful game. Always gamble responsibly. See Dunlouis.net for more. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. And you're very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you all the way through until 10 o'clock this morning. If you've just joined us, then you've missed Monday Night Rugby. Presented as it was by the hardest working man in show business. Owen, good morning to you. I'm delighted to be able to take that title after Nathan was wrongly given it yesterday morning. Look, we all party, Owen. So uh, here you are now. Welcome back. Uh, you were you were cheating on us with the evening show last night. It's uh, a beautiful feeling, you know. Uh, I guess I, I, I don't know what the, the sort of phrase I'm looking for here is. Uh, evening presenter uh, in the streets, AM presenter in the sheets, or whatever is the the, the cliche. Uh, or what I'm trying to fit in here. I don't know, but yes, exactly. Uh, 0879 if you've got a better way of uh, phrasing that than our own, uh, we'd love to hear it this morning. You can use the hashtag OTBM, or indeed you can do it on Twitter as well. It meant that you got to sit through the entire football match last night where um, Chelsea's new stars emerged, blinking into the sunlight, and now we know what they're going to look like a little bit. Uh, to, to a point, yeah. I guess two of the, the stars we were most looking forward to seeing were Kai Havertz and Timo Werner, and... There is a clip doing the rounds at the moment of Kai Havertz kicking the ball out of play, tr- attempting a crossfield pass, the ball hitting the wrong side of his boot and trickling out over the opposite sideline. So you can imagine Manchester United fans, Liverpool fans, having a lot of fun with that particular clip this morning. And he did look, I guess, the less ready of the two players. But there is still a chance, and not a chance, there is still a likelihood that uh, he is going to become an absolute superstar. You don't uh, judge somebody on their opening game like that. <laughs> yes, you do. Somebody. Let's overreact massively. He's a bust. That's what you're saying. He's a bust. Uh, he, like, he, in years to come, we'll be like, we should have seen this coming. Game one, Kai Havertz kicked the ball over the end line. And, and, and there was a second moment, I think, early in the second half, uh, where he goes for goal, and I think it ends up going over the sideline. Or maybe he was actually attempting a pass. Maybe it misses everybody. I, I'm open to correction on that one. He wasn't overly impressive. He was playing out on the right. Probably not the position for him. It'll be interesting to see if he gets into more of a, a central area, maybe as a number 10 over the next little while. Like, we've done pieces on the show over the last little while about where Timo Werner is even going to play. And I'm pretty sure people have been telling us that Werner could actually pop back into the number 10 role with Havertz as a number 9. So that, I would say, is something that might have been intriguing to some people yesterday. And uh, I guess when Werner was actually playing as your out-and-out 9 that ended that conversation because he was pretty good. Now, he didn't score, so the conversation is far from done. And Chelsea, as a conversation, is far from done because like, Pulisic wasn't there last night. Ziyech wasn't there last night. So half of their uh, four stellar forwards you'd have put down, or, or at least attacking midfielders, without half of them there, we still don't know what they're fully going to look like. So, sorry, Werner played number nine last night, did he? Yes. Right. Is that unexpected? Not really, to be honest. I think like he was either going to play there. Like In fairness, the whole number 10 thing, I guess, kind of looks like a bit of a surprise in hindsight that maybe we were actually expecting that because the way he played, he just looks absolutely set for this sort of setup as a Premier League number nine. The question I would definitely have is not really over him as the number nine. It's over maybe Ruben Loftus-Cheek as the 10 because that's where he was last night. And it seems that maybe Kai Havertz could come in there Ziyech could then come in on the right wing and then Mason Mount on the left will be replaced by Pulisic. Well, the Pulisic thing will definitely happen once he's back. Uh, Timo Werner did obviously win the first penalty and Jorginho Mm. scores that. So, uh, you know, I I don't play fancy uh, Premier League football. Does that count as an assist when you win the penalty? I presume it does, does it? It does indeed. So, But he only got a five-point haul yesterday. Like, this is... I mean, he had a lower haul than the likes of Callum Wilson certainly lowered in the likes of Jamie Vardy over the course of the weekend. Like the, the Premier League attacks right now, if you're looking at it from a fantasy perspective or just from a, a pure armchair perspective, they're all really well stacked and almost every team needs to have an outrageous talent up front 
for them to even be in the mix at the moment. It's certainly one of the things that you look at Tottenham and say to yourself, if they're not going to get the best of the Harry Kane, then they're screwed, to be totally honest. You almost need somebody who's going to flirt with the idea of getting 30 goals a season, even though they won't. You need somebody who's going to do that. Now, whether or not Timo Werner is going to be that guy, potentially not in his first season, but he did look dangerous around the box, and as you say, got the first penalty. He's going to be a very interesting uh, interview as well. Have a listen to this. This is Timo Werner speaking after uh, to Sky Sports after Chelsea's 3-1 win against Brighton last night. Have a listen. Although you were injured early on in the game, how did you find the game, the pace of it, and the difference between your, what you're used to? Yeah, Premier League is uh, different football because I think um, uh, defenders. I don't. I never play against uh, free uh, defenders like this, so tall, so so much. Uh, yeah, big, massive defenders, and um, yeah. But uh, the 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 game is for me. It's really it makes really fun because especially in the first half, I I have a lot of space where I can do my runs and um, I think when we can go like this and make the last passes we missed today I think we get for me and also for the rest of the team we get a lot of chances we can create in the in the Premier League and uh, I'm happy to be here do you think you'll be okay for Liverpool on Sunday of course in, in games like this you always fit you love him Owen, don't you You're, he's big fa- yeah big fan of the team of Arne. No, nothing nothing makes you more proud to be a Premier League football fan then somebody coming in from a different league and saying, wow, your defenders are so large. The, the pride that all Premier League fans feel this morning uh, must be something incredible when they listen to that clip. Size matters, it turns out. OTBM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We have three parts. Bernard Brogan interview coming your way. First part today is reflecting on the rivalry with Kerry. Um, the second part is on the commercialisation and the uh, and his role in that of the GA and also his relationship with um, the Dublin management, specifically with the manager who wins the five in a row and who actually only gives him about ten minutes playing time over the last uh, two years. So that relationship with Jim Gavin is fraught and quite tense in various portions of the book. And then uh, there's also great bits in the book where he talks about Pacquiao Roy absolutely killing him in meetings in front of everybody, like putting on a voice going, oh, Bernard Brogan thinks he's special, does he? Uh, in front of everybody, to the point where everybody's in howls of laughter. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk to him about that in part three of it. But what struck me reading the book so far is that the rivalry with Kerry was far more important and far more intense. It was a, it was a much bigger birth, uh, a, much, a much bigger factor in the birth of this Dublin team than the rivalry with Mayo, which I would have said was the defining rivalry of the great Dublin five-in-a-row team. I would have thought so too. I definitely think that Mayo is a more important rivalry for that Dublin team, for certainly the Jim Gavin Dublin team at this point, because even from Bernard Brogan's perspective, the 2013 final, which is the crowning glory in his career, that comes against Mayo. The best All-Ireland finals they've ever played were against Mayo. I, I still think the Mayo finals are, are better than the first game last year against Kerry. And also there's a real serious feel about it, so the fact that it's kind of every single year for three or four years and every game we know is going to be a cracker and the only cracker that actually matters in a championship. But the, the one thing, um, again, that I've never really thought about or spoken about uh, in, in any great depth to any of the people who were involved in it was the 2007 All-Ireland Football semi-final where Kerry beat Dublin. They beat them by three points, but it's, uh, um, maybe it's two points in the end, but Dublin get it back to just to score in stoppage time and then just run out of steam. And obviously Kerry go on to win another handy All-Ireland. And so we kind of blah, blah, blah away those All-Irelands where you, you only beat uh, Cork or Mayo. They don't really count that flaky Mayo team from the noughties in particular. But actually, that semi-final against uh, Kerry is the closest Paul Caffrey's Dublin ever get to winning an All-Ireland. The next year they get blitzed by Tyrone. He's gone and Pat Gilroy comes in and in their first year they come up against that Kerry team again. Except this time Dublin are going gangbusters and absolutely feel like, well, they're going to serve up a bit of revenge two years on from that uh, very close defeat against a Kerry team who were way better two years ago than they are now. And then obviously that's the buzzsaw, the start of Learwigs, Bank Holiday, one ten to two points after about a minute and a half. And it's like, oh. Uh, and so it turns out those two games actually loom large in, in that Dublin team's consciousness and turns them into the team or gives them the motivation and the chip to go on and become a team who eventually, it takes all the way from 2007 to 2011 for them to get over the line, but that's, they're the foundational texts 
for that great Dublin team as opposed to in the, the height of their glory seeing off a Mayo team who just weren't quite good enough. Mm. Yeah, re revenge is a, an interesting thing because the 2009 game, if Dublin go out and win that game, then everybody looks at 2007 as the defining moment. Whereas because they didn't win 2009, 2009 goes down as the defining moment because they get the job done in 2011. But if they didn't get the job done in 2011, then that might have been the thing that the straw that broke the camel's back to finally uh, instigate the Dublin revolution. But Or maybe it was never it, coming. Like it, it, maybe... <laughs> Maybe not. Like I, I think it just probably crystallises how insane the Pat Gilroy era must have been to try and dispel 15 years of hurt that were unbelievably highly publicised, that you were the, I don't want to say the laughing stock of Ireland at that point, but certainly Dublin were taken with a light touch by the rest of the country. Like you say 2007, had they beaten Kerry, they might have won the All-Ireland. Cork probably beat Dublin in that All Ireland. Let's let's face it. I, I think Cork were a better team. Cork probably had more bottle around that time, and that was the thing that Dublin had to find. It is this uh, nebulous idea of bottle and courage. And Pat Gilroy not only did he manage to have a pop off Bernard Brogan. I didn't know about that that, that anecdote, by the way. I'm not sure if it's in the book. That is, is hilarious. Yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, but I, I had seen the one about him pointing the finger at himself, Gilroy. That is and getting Bart, oh, his surname escapes me, and uh, to actually criticise everybody and to kind of really question Pat Gilroy's own cojones in front of the entire dressing room. That, for me, is a real mark of a manager who was like, whatever it takes, we need to be investigating. Whatever we need to do, we need to, to get done because we're close, but there just needs to be a mental shift here. The other thing is that this is the first book from anybody who's been involved in that five in a row team that actually talks about the football. Obviously, Philly McMahon wrote a book that was uh, award winning, but that wasn't a book really about football. That was a book about life and growing up in Ballymun and addiction and overcoming that and the impact of addiction on a family. And it was unbelievable stuff. But it wasn't about how the team breaks down into its little groups and who has responsibility and whose job it is to drive standards and training and who's helping who. Like there's a bit where Conor Callan is taking notes literally in the dressing room. He's got a, a notebook out in the middle of a game, it sounds like. Um, and uh, the, the level of um, psychological preparation and who the people are involved in that. Um, you know, Gary Keegan gets a, a number of shout outs to somebody who's been centrally involved in it. And I think probably the fact that um, Jim Gavin stepped away allows a lot of this information to come out and feel like it's okay. It's not It's not breaching any of the confidences of the change room. Yeah, like it, it's also interesting when you look at all the detail we are now getting and realising that this is just possibly the first of many books. Like I, Paul Finn obviously ha has done really good interviews since retiring about what, what's actually gone on in the, the Jim Gavin era. But as you say, the Philly book was the only book that had been written by the team and, and it wasn't a football book at all. So maybe Bernard Brogan is dipping his toe in the water here because it's a hard thing to do to be the first person to reveal all details of any regime. And the next book that comes out might have more details and will probably have a little bit of a layer cake effect, kind of like it was with the Kilkenny Hurlers, where the Jackie Tyrrell book was obviously outstanding. But maybe Owen Larkin's book last year adds a little bit more in ways that we didn't know. And all these different things as people get more comfortable with telling the stories uh we, we get a greater picture and also as well like I, 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 like from what i've read it's a, it's a brilliant brilliant book but bernard brogan is so close to the team at this point he's only just after going it must be tough to actually say yeah i'm going to say such and such a thing about my former teammates uh, or revealing details of a camp in which they were in now i know it makes it easier because jim gavin is no longer the football manager and maybe that's all you need to realize before actually putting pen to paper on this book and um, but i think that we're going to have a lot of content from this dublin team for the next decade and the more these players retire and leave the game probably the, the more free they will be to, to speak about it yeah and the more insight we're going to get into what made the greatest team of all time into the greatest team of all time um and and who knows uh, like maybe it's all, all very straightforward and uh but certainly the the information beginning to come out is in itself fascinating and uh, reason enough. So that interview with Bernard Brogan coming up around about half past nine this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, you can text the show on 87 180 or use the hashtag OTBAM. I'm delighted to say we're sticking with Gaelic football and we have two inter-county managers with us. Anthony Cunningham and Ryan McMenamin are both with us this morning. Gentlemen, you're both very welcome. Anthony, if I can start with you, um, officially allowed to gather people again for training sessions with specific fixtures in mind and the uh, edge of the championship upon us. It must have been a pretty exciting last 24 hours. Yes, 
suppose we can't wait to get going there tomorrow night. We 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 go back training there tomorrow night. So, um, yeah, we've been in contact with a lot of the guys there in club championship for the for the last couple of months, and it's great that they got a run into to a county championship. So, um, yeah, they're they're we have everybody bar county finalists, which are eight players there involved next weekend uh, between intermediate and senior and. After next Sunday, we have everybody. So, yeah, it's, it's a short run in though, and uh, hopefully injuries will be will be maintainable that at a level that that allows everybody to train. You know, that's that's the difficulty coming off club championship as well. But looking forward to it really, and I think the players are as well. It's going to be the most heavily planned individual training session of all time. You've had seven months to plan for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know, it's it's um, it's all about getting more football into the guys now, um, sharpening up their game and working on you know where we left off. Uh, obviously, we would have been working on you know certain aspects of our game, and uh, we continue with that. And um, for us, it's preparing for two league matches, which are vital. Um, they're they're very quickly now. We've got to come up on us like mid middle of middle of uh, October. We travel to Armagh, and uh, there was Sunday after we travel to to Cavan. And uh, we don't have a first round this year against against London, so it's middle of November for us against Mayo or Leitrim. Nice, nice three handy fixtures to look forward to. Two away games to uh, to Ulster teams, and then probably more than likely yeah. uh, Mayo. So uh, that's a that's about as, as short, sharp shock as you can expect, and no real time to to try anything new. Uh, Ryan McMenamin, from your perspective, what what is um, what is the main concern about getting people back out onto the playing field? Because there must be a huge temptation to try and jam in a load of work. But obviously, from a sports science perspective, that's not really the best way of going about things. Yeah, yeah, no. I think, I think, I think we sat down this weekend. I know with Fermanagh, we with Fermanagh, even with even with twenty clubs, uh, we still have ten clubs involved in the in the club championships. So um, we probably only have about fourteen, fifteen. So. We're probably going back tomorrow night as well, and looking. I know the lads have come off a club championship, and uh, and likely as well. They've, uh, some people are going to be in a high, some people are going to be in a low, and usually they hang to hang to overnight and they'll enjoy themselves or or commiserate it, you know. So look, you can't probably go at it, and you would just as Hank as Anthony was saying, it's more just about getting the football and more getting see see getting the sharpness of the players and just trying to get them up to a level where we. Can, we can train consistently because if you are tied with the 32 in the, in the panel, you can't really um, expect that you can go at high intensity all the time because if, if players start breaking down or if a player takes an injury or whatever and with the shortened season, I think that's his season over. So uh, we have to be mindful of that there and we have to be mindful of the players and I think that's why we've, we're probably trying to have a, as I say, a soft, a soft land for the lads coming in. So we're, we're probably going to probably probably not start ramping it up to next week, you know, so we're just gonna we're gonna ease boys back in that as as much as possible. They, go on, sorry. Sorry, sir. Right, Ryan, how high is that ramp? When you talk about ramping it up, it, like from, uh, say, the, the latter stages of a club championship uh, in Fermanagh to actually inter county level, how much work do you suspect there is to be done with the players? Um well we've We've been keeping an eye on them and and with the GPSs and the boys have been loading up the boys have been loading up their weekly totals so we kind of have an idea where where each player's at you know so um, again you're gonna ha you're gonna have different players at different levels um, you're gonna have players coming back off a junior championship or players coming off an intermediate they're gonna it's gonna be played at a different level than a senior championship and then um, I, think, I think we all know when when you do go up to Inter County at the level just is a is a way above. Of all club championships, and uh, it's just about monitors and the whole thing. And we probably like to think we have a bit. I know we're in, we have two league games for we're away to Clare and home the least. So we'll be looking to we'll be looking we'll be looking even to build up on that there. And we've down on in the first week of November. So we'll be hopefully having the boys hopefully hopefully going well by by the by the second league game. You know, so we're going to have to. We do have to. You do have to take the players' welfare in, in case, and that's and that's what Rasso will be. It'll be hopefully in October time will we will we start and raise the ramp. Yeah, and that, that's it. like that whole kind of notion of making sure that everybody's ready for the championship. You've got to make sure that they're ready for the the league games as well, because there's so much riding on the league. Um, from your perspective, are there lessons about this shortened preseason that we can take into whatever next year might look like? Oh, definitely. A lot of um, probably you were do, 
you were stuck on something maybe and you, and you thought it was probably the right thing to do. I know I, w- I was chatting to Matty Donnelly recently and the two of us were chatting about it, but um, even in times gone past, they were saying that an inter-county season, if you were knocked out in June, you were kind of going, oh, it's a short season, but in, in all fairness, you were you were out from November and that's maybe eight months, like that's seven and a half months you're probably out. And I'm sure Anthony will tell you, people, they talk about the inter-county game being great and there's no fun stuck in the middle of a trading session in the middle of December and mm-hmm. <laughs> the sleet and the rain coming off you, you know, and it's, it's uh, it, 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 you do kind of kind of go, you do kind of wonder to yourself maybe what's it all about, but probably, I think, I think a lot more probably can be learned is that that you can trust the players more, like I think we were always of the opinion that the that the players come and, and they look after themselves and, and probably that we can monitor them from afar and they can do the stuff and this, with the shortened season, it's good for the club and it's good for the it's good for the county and it's, it's probably it's good for the players as well. And but if the players can know that their um, that the emphasis is on them to get themselves shape, shape in good shape this year, and it, put, it puts more on them and, and it leaves less work for us to do. Mm. Yeah, for for me, it's it's um, I think we've we've learned quite a bit from the way the club championship has been run this year. I think it probably will go to a split season. Um, whether the country gets, you know, to play until July and then there's three or four months that's concentrated for the club. You know, the feedback uh, is that club players like that and county players also like that. As, as Roycey has said there, it's, it's a defined um, season. Um, you know, going from a November, December time frame to the following, you know, summer is, is difficult. Um, I think April doesn't work. Um, while it's while it's a club month, you know, it, you know, players still still train with with their full eyes really on on uh, county uh, during that month. So, um, yeah, it, no doubt it has to be. I, I think results on the day as well for clubs. I think clubs has been very drawn out. Replays, appeals, um, you you have it. <laughs> um, whereas whereas uh, county setups now, you know, have have looked in, in the backdoor system have looked for result on the day. I think all games have to go that way now. Um, it's just a pity from our point of view that there isn't the second bite of the cherry um, in the football inter county championship this year um, because, um, yeah, there, there could have been a play there for, for you know, why, why, do we have, why do we need the two league matches? Why can't we have uh, everybody get two championship matches this year? Um, but I think that, that we, we have to, as, as, as an organisation in the GEA, get the, the balance correct and... Um, Get, get results on a day and have a defined season. Um, there's more interest in that. There's more interest from players. Um, and as, as Rousey has said, there's science and, you know, GPS track and knowing, knowing the loads that players have and what to get to, we monitor that every week. So uh, that's, that's we, we lessen our injuries by doing that. So I think uh, as more science has helped us on, on that anyway. Yeah, and it really feels like that the season is reaching a crescendo now on so many different levels because, like, it kind of feels like a, a big tournament year in the Premier League or something, Anthony, where you're watching players play for their club and then wondering will they get into the international team. It kind of feels the same way, I'd imagine, from your perspective, watching players play for their club over the last few months and identifying potentially new players for the intercounty setup. I'm not sure if that's something you've done where you've actually used the championship uh, as a ground to actually look at potential new players. Yeah, we 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 definitely have picked up two or three players in the club championship. Uh, one or two would have been probably in the county scene before, or maybe had long term injuries, but have come back. So that has been most welcome. Um, so yes, um, yeah, whether whether the G A decide to go county first and then club, I think um, defined seasons and they've been shorter and um, having you know having the proper number of games, but still. Um, not the, not the drawn out uh, point that that the Ricey is talking about there in going back in November December and and having a long long wait pre season tournaments clashes with uh, third level colleges etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah it's time for it's time for change and uh, I think I think the GA will get to that um, hopefully um, but okay there's there's also the commercial aspect of it they they do need to be games to keep uh, because it's it's a large um, it's a large industry, and that's that. That point is very prevalent, uh, particularly with the lockdown that we've had. Um, that the, 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 there's a lot of people tied up in, um, in the GAA and full-time coaches and full-time staff, and um, yeah, it's it's a difficult uh, one to get right. But I I think they will change, and um, 
yeah, keep the game at, at, at the highest level. Yeah, uh, Ryan, before this all happened, I know you hadn't been fully on board with the way that the two-tier championship was evolving. The, the two-part season, I think, as, as Anthony points out, there's a, it seems like there's an unstoppable me momentum behind that. So we will see a split season and most people are in agreement with that. But that conversation about what happens with the inter-county season, what it looks like after that, that kind of hasn't happened. That's kind of like, oh, we'll, we kick that part of the can down the road for the moment. What would you like to see in a shortened inter-county season? What should that season actually look like? Look, I think everyone, everyone, has different, I think everyone has different views of what they want. You know, I think we're probably of the opinion, and I know in Fermanagh or whatever, that we'd, we'd like, a, like a shot at the Sam McGuire now, whether we're going to win it or not, it's another thing. But we'd feel that it's, I know there's, we'd feel maybe that every county deserves at least one shot at it anyway, and that, that they have to go on a runner. I know if you're asking, it's just more, it's, it's, for, the, it's for the people in the that supporters are actually watching it. You know that if they feel that they're going to go to a tier two, I know whenever uh, Fermanagh played their own, even in the McKenna Cup, you could get five, six thousand people at it because people people want to come out and they want to see the big teams, they want to see the big players, and they want to see the big names in football. And uh, Fermanagh is no different that that they want to play against the top teams. And uh, I'm I'm sure that I know any time when we at training with Fermanagh or going up to big league matches like for example we played Roscommon this we're, we're lucky to get a win but the lads knew Roscommon were, were one of the top eight teams in the in the country and probably that, that week at training was the easiest week you could ever have because the lads knew that they had, they, we were playing a top team and they wanted, and they wanted to go out and, and they wanted to go out to prove themselves against a top team for me the discussion I'd say look it's probably going to be out of my hands or it's going to be out of the out of the play, it'll be out of the players' hands. It'll, I think probably they will go probably with the with the tier two. Now, if if they do, they do, and it just would just I'd like to see the structure on it. You know, to see what way it is going to be worked. Because I think um, I think there has there has to be more discussion on it. But um, if if we we'll get that opportunity, I'm not too sure. I, I, hopefully we can start those having those conversations and getting those opinions out there because that's the way it'll happen where somebody comes up with a good idea and support rallies behind it unless they've just decided that the previous options which were designed for an entirely different world and an entirely different calendar are going to somehow be shoehorned into the split season idea. Anthony Roscommon are obviously one of those counties that would occasionally have been in tier two, more recently very defined uh, uh, a tier one county but you know, his, history suggests that there'll be a, an element of time where in the cycle things aren't going great and then there'll be another element of time where things are going great. So I'd be very interested to hear what you think uh, the structure should be to get the most out of all counties and to give them a crack at something meaningful over the course of the summer. Um, I'd agree with Ricey there. I think everybody has to have and everybody has to play in the, in the Sam Maguire. Um, I don't see a reason why that shouldn't be. Um, the question is for the development of of second year teams, uh, if there are second year teams, uh, but for the development of, of other teams that that maybe need extra games during a summer campaign while uh, the summer wear goes on, or if they're knocked out of the championship earlier, I think that should be there. It's all about development, and um, it's only it's only with with uh, with games and and a competitive environment that other teams can get better. Um, but for sure, I, I don't think we can ever have a, a, a tier championship without everybody having a right to play for the top um, the top prize. Um, but uh, we have to we have to be able to help other counties uh, and include the Roscommons and, and all other counties that are building um, because um, the top four or the top two or the top one may be at Dublin presently or maybe two would carry uh, we'll get too far ahead. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we have to have proper planning in it, but I think everybody has got to play and have the right to play um, for, for, for the Sam Maguire. And then it's, not, it's all about development of, of can we have a proper championship then uh, to help other teams. Is there a forum for you two to have a voice in this? I think it might be important for somebody who's at the coalface to be able to articulate a view that's heard at central level when it comes to this, as opposed to the central commission, the central committee uh, who obviously was it's supposed to be representative of all the different um, bodies, but like currently, is there a forum you feel like there is some way for you to contribute to this debate? 
Uh, yeah, good point. Uh, I, I don't think there is. I, I'm, not, I'm not definitely involved, but uh, and I know most AP County managers are involved, but uh, that's the one thing I think that they have to look at. Um, and I know disrespects to the administrators of the game. A lot of them probably are a bit removed from the needs. Um, we, we talked about their development and load on players and um, split seasons, and I think um, there's a lot of different angles that that say Ricey would have there. Um, maybe maybe right up a few, and, and there's there's loads of others that are very knowledgeable and that should be heard. And it's it's a proper point, and uh, yeah, definitely. One last thing on this: we we've seen obviously the amount of money that is associated with running teams has become a theme. It was a, a central theme of the Director General's report last year. It was kind of one of the, the main takeaways was this is. Um, you know, a huge expense and we need to rein those expenses in and then obviously there was a row with the GPA on the back of that. What would the what would a, a curtailed spend mean on a day to day basis for an intercounty manager, Anthony? Yeah, it's 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 difficult. Again, they're just thrown out as well. Not, not a lot of discussion on them, to be honest. Um but for us in Roscommon there's there's, there's almost half the panel uh, who live or work in Dublin. Uh so there's a there's a large travel bill. There's no doubt, and now there's restrictions on the numbers that can travel in a car, and they've got to come probably on their own to training. Um, so it's unlike maybe other larger cities. It's probably it's probably similar in Fermanagh, but they're probably in in in, in other counties as well. And the, there's there's a larger travel bill for some counties, um, which needs to be taken into into account. You know, if you're a Galway or a you know a Limerick or a Cork or you know, you're, you're attached to larger cities. Most of the most of the players are in that county, and it just, it just the, the demographics of Roscommon. A lot of the players and a lot of the younger players now are going to college in Dublin, and and inevitably finish up working in in Dublin. So, for us, there's a large travel bill, and that, that's a, that's a restriction if it's um, if it's going to be that there's X amount of money for for um, for for travel, which which they're they're entitled to, and I agree with the GPA. Um, so it, it isn't one cap fits all for sure. But um, for us, backroom team, it should be okay. Um, the, the, the numbers on the panel, you know, you just can't run it with, with 32, 34 in my view, because with, with injuries, you do need, you know, you start off, you need three goalies, you need, you need, you definitely need backup with, with injuries and coming off a club championship uh, and a shortened season, you definitely have to have a, a call on bigger numbers. Because that was one of the things mentioned last week, Anthony, wasn't it? That they will uh, allow 32 players on a squad, but funding and how much uh, onus is taken upon expenses, that, that'll then go on to the county boards to pay the expenses beyond the 32. Uh, I think that's what you're getting at there, is it? Hey, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, the county boards will say now they've, they've, they've no funding really because they've, they've got no revenue from club games, uh, maybe some revenue from the live stream, streaming. Um yeah, it's 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 difficult. It's more more, more certainly will be difficult. But uh, you know, uh, sensibly, I think the GA can't say here. You know, that's that's your budget, and the same as the county who sits right beside you. They they'll have to forensically look at um, the amount of, of travel and the the amount of spend um, that 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 historically has been built up in in a, in a proper fashion. Yeah, and look, a, a progressive approach to that should actually be possible given that there's a lot of information there's a lot of data now available in terms of how many people you have traveling and, and the mileage so a, a county like Roscommon might be punished much more than another county if mileage was to be cut and all of a sudden you have players making the decision actually you know what it's not really worth my while or I can't make the training. Ryan I did, I did want to ask you the, the question about um, everybody competing for the Sam Maguire this is one of those years where there's suddenly a bit of doubt we don't know what Dublin are going to look like we don't know what Kerry are going to look like all of a sudden, there might be a possibility for a team to get a bit of momentum, go on a bit of a run, and knock off some of the favourites. So, I, I don't know if you've had that chat yet with the Fermanagh lads, but they must surely be dreaming that the, the winter pitches, the weather, that's all a bit of an equaliser. Uh, it is, it is, and uh, I think it's probably uh, it's one of them things that if you do go on a run, and probably if you look, even looked at Ulster club football at this time, it's, it's usually... It's usually a bounce of a ball that usually uh, sorts it out, and, and usually, as you said, the elements is a good equaliser. Look, uh, we haven't had the discussion with the players yet, and we, have, we haven't got them in. We've let, we just let the players we've we've let the players enjoy the club championships is what is what they're meant to do. But I think all round, all round, just chatting to different people in round, maybe from Donegal or Cavan, 
they are looking forward to it, football because I think they do think it is a chance that that they will catch it. That a lot of play teams will be caught out um, because of this. And because I know I agree with Anthony on that. That maybe we sh- we should have had a a second bite at the cherry. I think it probably it it could have been worked if if we, if we really wanted to. Um, because even if you looked at the, even with the Saturday night games being streamed, or even with on Sundays, or even I know and thrown, they've been immensely popular. I know um, a Friday night game, they've been immensely popular and thrown. And um, but I definitely do think there there is no one knows what Dublin or Kerry is going to be like. Um, there will be a lot of teams in that second tier, like the likes of Donegal, the likes of Throne, will probably fancy their chances that. That this is their year, and I'd, I look, it only takes it only takes one or two injuries out of any team maybe to to disrupt it. And, and as you know, coming in to, after a club championship, anything can happen, and anything can happen with injuries. Ways a player can go back to first aid and pick up a knock, and it could set you off. But look, um, as as we always said, and the Fermanagh fellas know this, probably when um, Fermanagh are probably at their best, maybe when. When no one's expected of them, and especially in a one-off game, there would be no one to prove a few shocks, you know. But I'm, I'm probably, I'm conscious that Paddy Talley is probably thinking Downer are in the exact same boat when they when they went on a run in 2010. So to me, I think it, it is open, but it is it is going to be hard to look past past the top top four, top five teams, and you probably go back to Anthony's point there of um, development. Um, the way the the way probably the system's set up now, it's it's the strong's always going to get stronger. Like the super eights, the super eights is going to make the top teams always play better. Like because if you're playing a top team every every July, you know you're always there, and you're you're playing Dublin at least twice a year, three times a year. You're definitely going to get better. And um, I know Malachy O'Rourke made that point when I was chatting him one time that he says it's probably the place you want to be in the playing training in the middle of July. And knowing you have three three championship games, and uh, he says you're you're only going to get better. And like for for putting us into a tier two, where you're going to play, you're not going to have an opportunity to play the better teams. You're never going to get better. You're only going to play. You're only going to get. You're only going to get at the same level as as you're playing at. So there's a lot of points in there. And, I know drifted from your point, but I do actually probably in this year there there is a great opportunity for teams. And look, at the, it, it will all depend. It will all depend on the players and the injuries. And if, if each team gets a good run of injury, um, keeps everyone free from injury, we could uh, you could see a lot of upsets. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it now. Great to have you both with us this morning. Enjoy the return of the training sessions and always thoughtful stuff from both of you. Thanks a million, lads. Okay, thank you. Thank Andy you. Cunningham and Ryan McMenamin there giving us their thoughts on the championship format and the return to training and what it's going to be like. Uh, a lot of a lot of stuff going into all of that. Uh, 087 9180 180 is the number. I want to tell you about what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today. A really busy day for us. Uh, Alan Quinlan's has the head. Today is his piece with Pat Short. It's a brilliant interview where they talk about um, mental health and just looking after yourself and all the things that you need to do. OTB Gold today is Joe Malloy meeting Ruby Walsh uh, live from 2 o'clock today. It is Dadcast. It is our Paddy Power Premier League preview. Uh, it's Willa Callahan and Kenny Cunningham joined by Gordon Strachan, Jamie Redknapp and Phil Thompson. Then the Paddy Power half hour, Will and Ender are going to be joined by Paddy Power himself and Gary Breen. David Myler meets Wes Brown at 5.15 and OTB Gold is inside Harrington's house. So a stellar day for you on OTB Sports Radio. You get that on the OTB Sports app. Just search for OTB Sports in the uh, App Store and when you download it, click the radio button and away you go. OTBM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Now, Roy O'Connor spoke on Monday Night Rugby last night about why he feels Ross Byrne is definitely now Ireland's number two out half. Uh, let's talk about Ross Byrne, lads. And Rory, it seems that the, R- Ross Byrne and Johnny Sexton are obviously going to be inextricably linked when we talk about them because of the problems that they play for. But it's around this time in Sexton's career when he became the starter for Ireland at Six Nations level anyway. Uh, how similar are those trajectories at the moment? It seems that Ross Byrne rarely, if ever, puts a foot wrong. Yeah, it, like Ross Byrne must, must be wondering what he has to do to get a bit of positive PR. So I, I think he, he deserves it after the weekend. But I mean... He hasn't even like he's been waiting patiently for Johnny Sexton to 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 head off into the sunset for a couple of years. He turned down a move to Ulster when Joe Schmidt and, and David Newsafor were trying to get himself and Joey Carbu to make a move and, and and saw off 
Joey Carberry at the time, who I think a lot of people thought were was the better player, but he backed himself and, and, and Leinster in fairness backed him ahead of Carberry at that number ten role. Carberry was the fifteen. And he's still waiting patiently for Johnny Sexton to come through. And everyone's talking about his little brother as the the man. Like Brian O'Driscoll's been on this this show anointing Harry, you know, who is excellent and is a flashier player and has a lot more of the kind of athletic ability, I think, to go on and be a world class player than Ross. But Ross has a now got a proven CV of delivering in, in a lot of very big games for Leinster, in, you know, in one of the best teams in the world. And he steps in for one of the best players in the world. And the team's performance rarely dips. And I think his game management, which is one of those slightly indefinable things that, you, can, you know, it's, it, there's no numbers to kind of measure it. But his he comes in and he makes the right decisions at the right time for his team. He, he His technical abilities are very, very good. As Keith mentioned, his touch finding, things like that. You know, he, he rarely makes a mistake. His goal kicking is very, very good. And his option taking, I think, is the biggest thing. I think he makes the right decision nearly all of the time. And and that, from your number ten, you don't necessarily need a, a, a bit, you know a really flashy player who makes you know line breaks all the time. Although his running was very good at the weekend, probably better than I've seen before. I think he he you know he'd earned that start, um, having kind of started the semi finals against Munster the last last year. I think he'd earned a start in a final, and you know. It, the, the, a measure of the job that he did was that by the time Johnny came in, really, Johnny came in for a lap of honour and a 20-minute run out for Saracens. Now, he drops out of the team this week, you'd expect. But I think if anything happens to Sexton, they'll have no hesitation in sending him in because of the role that he's played in their success so far and the trust that they have in him. And while Harry is a really, really exciting player and so is Kieran Frawley, I think they've still got a fair bit of work to do because Ross has proven himself um, to be a very, very willing and hardy competitor and I think he is Ireland's number two out half at the moment, even though he, he, he won't start the biggest games for Leinster of Sexton as fifth. It's 8.41 this morning here on OTBAM, and I'm delighted to say Ronan O'Gara is with us. Ronan, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Hey, Jar. I'm OK. I'm OK yourself. So we're talking there about Ross Byrne and um, how he's nailed down the understudy role. I don't know if it's still fair to call it an understudy role to Johnny Sexton, but, um, like... This is an important time to be the number two because we don't know how long Johnny Sexton is going to be able to compete at this level for. Yeah, he has been uh, steadily improving. Uh, absolutely no doubt about it. And I think it's been hard for him too because he's in the shadow of, of a great, great player. And maybe he'll get better when Johnny goes. Um, but I think, as Rory says there, he's. Um, he, he, I think uh, the big bonus I suppose was his running game at the weekend he was a threat with ball in hand I think he is really really strong tactically and he marshals his team brilliantly around the pitch And uh, but it was also I think great management of a squad from Leinster's point of view and the fact that uh, initially I was a bit surprised that Johnny wouldn't start the final and then you kind of look at the minutes played and you reward the guy who has got them there and then uh, what a performance he had at the weekend so um you know, I think when you listen, you have Harry Byrne chomping to get in there. His big brother is is not for budging, and then you have someone like Kieran Frawley there. It's um, it's a it's a it's a great place to be. But that's, I suppose, just the words, it's the act that the the Leinster, I suppose, Leo and uh, Stuart are managing that situation. Um, it, it's uh, it, it was a great a bit of shrewd management, I thought. One of the things that um, Ross Byrne doesn't have a whole heap of experience of is playing behind a pack that's getting beaten up. Um, he did play in the England game in the World Cup warm-ups when there was that Hunger Games going on to see who was going to be the out-half that got to go uh, uh, as backup. And everybody came out of that game with reputations a little bit damaged. So it was a bit unfair for that to be his audition for Ireland in some ways. Yeah, exactly. You're right. And it's not his fault that the Leinster pack are going forward every week. Um, Sure, you know, he has to be judged on what he's doing. And he's, I think what you'd have to say is that is he getting better every week? And I think he is. And he is a very good game management manager. And the reality is he'll probably be better in four years' time because we're just with the age profile. And as a, as a 10, you need to be playing. And he's playing a lot now, but he, he's still probably... Uh, you know, on the shy side of of experience in terms of, for example, you look at Finn Russell for, for, for Racing, you know, how consistent he has got in the last 18 months. And I think that's an experience thing. It's a confidence thing. But that's what happens with, in the number 10 position, that if you find yourself playing three out of the four Saturdays and you're playing in, in a good side and you have talent and you work hard, you will get better. There's a, a, an element of patience about staying at Leinster because you you know you're looking forward to the point where you're going to be the number ten, 
and at the same time you still have an all-time great in Johnny Sexton who is raging at the dying of the light and saying, I'm not going anywhere, there's the Lions to look forward to and then if I still feel fit after that, I'm going to keep playing. Yeah, well, exactly, and that's, uh, you know, I saw that in the Crusaders too. It's guys that want to be part of um, a great culture, a great environment, a great legacy in terms of uh, the guy who springs to mind would be Tim Bateman. For me, I think he might have played four games, but when he played, he was really good. But he actually kind of saw his role, the importance of, of preparing the so-called first team for the weekend. And um, he wanted to kind of be part of a team that were, were all about silverware as opposed to maybe moving to any of the other New Zealand franchises and being a starter every week. So, uh, so much of it has got to do with the mindset of... of what players want to achieve and, and how much uh, I suppose they feel valued or would be it and uh, Leinster are excelling in that if you take the number 10 position in a case in point it's a big game there's silverware on the line but they staff going up um, Ross Byrne is playing 10 this week that's the way it is We have Bernard Brogan on a little bit later on talking about his book and he makes the point that after he came back from his cruise he, he had a, you know worked unbelievably hard to get back in record time beat all the benchmarks from anybody who could find access to the details, got back in time, and over the next two years essentially played two, five minutes of uh, football, and yet was at every training session, was fit for everything, was always available, was driving standards and training, was giving feedback to people. Um, that's the a level of commitment to that type of team building that you're talking about that very few people actually have at the end of their career. Yeah, and, and I think when you're a player in that environment and you're a competitor, it's not actually what people write about you. It's kind of what the boys in the dressing room say about you when you're gone. So, you know, it's your talk about leaving in a better place and Bernard Brogan is a perfect example of it. Yeah, he didn't probably, um, I suppose, get the, the massive game time that he would have craved, but I think uh, you can see in, in the way, I suppose, he's transitioned out from his retirement that... He feels really good about himself because I think he, he stayed true to his values and he and he, he left every ounce out on the Dublin training pitch and um, that's I think what happens when you got high performing um, competitors and it's, it'll be the same and Leinster was the same and Munster in, in my time when you play but then there comes a time when you know nearly that okay my time is up here now and but but it's so hard to <laughs> so hard to accept that and and it becomes. Uh, a really tricky point in um, in the eyes of the manager. A manager who obviously has trusted you for so long and it's tough for them as well to pull the plug at times in your starting berth, I'd imagine. Of course, and that's it because you see it very differently. You're blind to it and you don't see it. And I can remember my last season with Munster. I was probably... Um, in denial, but then six months later, you kind of go, well, actually... Um, yeah, I can see what they were saying. I can see I was valuable, but nowhere near as valuable as I thought I was. But that's, you got to be thinking you're more important. Otherwise, if you lose that kind of, that dying, burning will inside you, then the game is already up because it's so hard uh, to win these semi-finals or finals of European Cups. But um, I think... Um, what you don't see from a player's point of view is that you don't see the global vision and that's what skilled managers do. They kind of just kind of probably lead you to a point where, okay, I can kind of understand it, but I don't accept it. it it's almost essential to be pig-headed as an athlete, I'd imagine, Ronan, that you have to believe that you still have it at all times. Otherwise, it'll be a very, very quick end. I'm just guessing there, but it sounds from the way you talk from a lot, from a lot of uh, ex-professionals from the end of their days, you almost need to believe that the end of days is never coming. Yeah, you do, genuinely, because I honestly, it keeps coming back to performance because it's it's the same, I suppose, rationale for why would you put in a guy that's 18 into a national team or, or why would you play a guy at 35 in the national team? Well, if his performances are good enough and he's consistently doing it, then he fits the criteria to start every week. But when you get to the latter stages of your career with the body, it becomes more and more difficult because of, I suppose, different mental stimulus in terms of some guys the majority of the dressing room probably aren't your generation, but that doesn't really matter if you're a competitor because you see it as an internal internal game against yourself and the opportunity to play for your country or play for a team that you love becomes so 
powerful and you don't lose that in your mid thirties at all. That's the reality of it. It just sometimes it becomes harder and harder to back up those really high performances that you have set your standard that you kind of known throughout your late twenties or early thirties. Now that you're a coach, do you uh, do you uh, like look at the the kid and go, well, he's got more room to grow, or do you look at the do you anonymize it in your head and go, what's actually my best outcome this week? Yeah, I think it's every situation is completely different, George, for me, and I think it's something that you have to uh, really uh, stew over in your head many, many, many a time before you can come to final decision. Because obviously, there's there's a lot of pluses for one scenario, and there's a lot of negatives for the other scenario. But you sometimes there's very, very, very little in it. You just got got to trust your gut, and it is for this week. I think maybe something that I got better. I hope over my fledging coaching career would be uh, that it's n it doesn't become that for it's not a finite decision it becomes this decision for this week and then you kind of I suppose uh, re uh, restart on a Sunday night with building for the performance for this Saturday so uh, the calls become become very very um, uh, very little margin between a positive or a negative about why you would leave a guy out and why would you would you put him in and that's something that essentially that you can you can actually put your hand and say that I actually got that wrong. Yeah, well, so in Brogan's case, for example, he he thinks that there was an unconscious bias against him because he's one of the older lads. That if if he had been a twenty year old doing what he was doing in training, they would have had him straight in the team to make sure that they knew exactly what he was capable of. But because they'd seen him and they'd seen him make a few mistakes in games, they were like, well, look, we know what he can do. He's, he's great for us for, for training at the moment. And that, that left him with a sense of injustice. Yeah, well, I, guess I don't, you know, I think the coach is getting a picture of we see whatever in football, 70 minutes on a Sunday in Crow Park, what they're doing. But like, um, you know, I mean, the, the Dublin management get to see him essentially five nights a week or five days a week whenever they're whenever they're trained so there's so much more i suppose that goes into this the decision than the public would be aware of and um it genuinely could actually be tiny tiny margins and um you know you're looking at a, at a team where like it was even bloody difficult to make the dublin bench wasn't it so he couldn't, um, he couldn't make the b team in the a versus b game at one point towards the end and still kept showing up yeah, but he's got to show up. Like that for me is the minimum. Like you're talking about one of the greatest footballers that Dublin uh, has played. Maybe you know that's probably not an outrageous comment, but like he, he kept showing up. Of course, he showed sure showed up. That's the, that's his minimum duty to his teammates. He doesn't want um, to be remembered for for sulking for the last six months of his intercounty career and undo all the other previous fifteen years of good work. So I would say. He kept showing up. Yes, of course he kept showing up because he actually has a responsibility to his teammates to show up to kind of, because the jersey has given him a lot as well. So I would think that would be the minimum he would do. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a fair point. Like, I, I get the idea as well that there... Well, you know, I can think, you know what I mean? I remember when I got like dropped by Ireland and, um, you know, uh, I was asked... Um, you know, do you want to do you want to go to training? And I was saying, do I want to go to training? I said, it's everything I stand for. Of course, I'd be a part. And I was, it, why am I am I too difficult to to handle for the squad, or or, or what's the rationale? But like, just because you're not picked, and uh, I think it's Paddy Jackson and Johnny Sexton who are ahead of you. Um, of course, I'm going I'm going to train. And I have a responsibility to make the team better for this for this weekend. Yeah, I'm disappointed. I'm left out, but I can I. Can, don't worry about me. I can manage that. I, I'll. I'd like to think, you know, that this is. It wasn't. I was a starter, not for the previous eighteen months. My head is well around this. It's out of the squad. Yeah, it's another hammer blow. But it's it's what's best for the team. And and even as a player, I think uh, at the latter stages, especially in my mid thirties, I would have I would have really really got that. But to kind of be asked, do you want to go to training? Was kind of taken aback by that because. Uh, you know, it's easy be having the smile in the front when when you're 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 front and center. But it, you kind of it's adversity is when you see the real character, and that's what makes a good environment. I think. Do you feel that p players in that, that situation are often patronized? That uh, there's kind of like a tap on the head saying you you kind of look after yourself now. Don't be worrying 
uh, about showing up to training or I, I don't know going above and beyond when you're not actually in the starting team because the way you're talking there it's like no actually forget that notion I'm, I'm going to do uh, uh, what I do and always bring the highest level of standard yeah and I think that comes from I suppose um constant feedback and depending on the relationship with the coach but there's also uh, there's the head man there but there's also another you know I mean 15 potential coaches or management that you care about that you have a relationship with that you that you feel you have a responsibility to to show your best side and when 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 you get left out and we're faced with bitter disappointment you, you, that's when people will be watching so it was kind of important that um when you talk to, I suppose, uh, sports psychologists or your mentors or people that looked after you, cared about you, it's kind of, it was good that you kind of give them a reaction that they least expect or they'd expect you to kind of be down. But actually, no, don't be. It's tough, but it can be done. And I think that's was probably passed on from players that I, that I played with that were competitors that, that you learned from and that that made you kind of appreciate it. It's still playing for Munster, still playing for Ireland or the Lions. It's it's whether you're on the start in fifteen or you're outside the group, it's 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 a it's a great um position to be in when you stand back from it. Well were you gonna ask one more about Ross Byrne? Uh, th there was just uh, uh, one final point on uh, on Ross Byrne, Ronan. The, um, Keith Wood was making the point last night that he's actually developed a new element of his game where he is willing to step forward uh, a lot more, where he is willing to take the tackle a lot more than he used to. I'm not sure if that's something that you've also identified, if, if that's something that kind of takes time as an out have to actually have the bravery to realise that you need to take that risk, you need to, to be able to take that big hit with fellas coming at you. Yeah, I... Um... Well, there's obviously two sides that there's. I think he's very brave in the fence, and he makes his tackles, and that's important. With the ball, I think that's um, something he's got better, and he will get better. Will get be better at. But I, I think um, you know the mistake a lot of people make is that you compare him to you know a great um, player and Johnny, and Johnny is Johnny, and he's. Um, has his own legacy. What Ross Burnley said was concentrating himself, and I think he's getting that opportunity to grow in the in the Leinster team. And he is, uh, I think, making um, really telling um, impact in the game, as 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 the lad said um, in the previous discussion. Um, he seems to be. I suppose the more we see of him, the more he feels. Um, natural, composed, confident, and I think that'll only get only get um, better from his point of view because I think he does has a, he has a probably underappreciated uh capacity to influence the game more than people realise. I think he's um very good at, at calling the right play at the right time and then there's other times where um I think he's very smart in terms of uh he understands what his forwards needs and he has a nice bit of old school out half of him and well the fact that he can he can kick the ball and he can kick the ball far. Uh, running the, the top 14 fixtures, they're off for a couple of weeks now, is that right? Uh, well, you're off if you're not in Europe and we're not in Europe, so, well, no, the big teams are playing this weekend. Obviously, right. there's yeah. uh, three French teams, yeah, playing quarterfinals, so that's why, yeah, next two weekends, quarterfinals, semifinals, yeah, and then back the following weekend. And do you give the players a down week or do you get ac extra pre-season into them? How do you treat that? No, this week now is, is a few days off and then back on Friday for COVID testing and hopefully we get the all clear from that and then you kind of have a training week next week and then a normal week with the week of the racing game. So, um, yeah, so we we uh, we lost it to Toulouse at the weekend. Um away from home, which is disappointing. We were good for, well, good-ish for 74 minutes, three points in it, and then explode in the last six. So uh, we've worked to do, but that's that's to be expected. I uh, see so one, one and, and last one coming back um, since the start of the season, the restart of the season, start of the new season, obviously. How, how has that whole experience been? Um, it's a bit surreal, obviously, with the, uh, with just, uh, a lot of the time we have to train in the afternoon because we have to get testing the morning and then you have to wait the kind of four hours till you get the results. We've been really lucky in the fact we've brilliant, I suppose, um, local laboratories that are helping us out and I suppose um, 
fast tracking our, our, our testing so it gives us the capacity to be tested three or four times a week and get the results within the space of a few hours um so that's worked well but you just kind of have to always be uh tweaking your i suppose your daily schedule um but yeah, it's great to be playing rugby that's the most important thing we've we, we had a good win against toulon at home and then uh, just kind of um um disappointing against toulouse but um some aspects were good we've taken a step forward no doubt about it but uh, you know kind of when you're someone like colby and your team it's hard, hard to get to defend them at times and he scored two tries out of nothing at the weekend and those 14 points were the difference the um return there's been a lot of penalties being given away as players are kind of getting used to what the uh, i think probably players and um the officials as well getting used to what the rules are supposed to be and how they're supposed to be interpreted has that been the same in france or has, has essentially uh, it been the same as last season in the, i'd say it's been w worse in france but that wouldn't be a surprise i think in the fact that um you know i mean people use the word discipline but your discipline's an act and it's something you need to it's it's a behavior and it's something you need to work monday to friday you can't just be disciplined on a saturday so a lot of the penalty counts here are up in the 40s um which is a staggering statistic, really, in terms of um, the top 14 games. Yeah, but like, um, A would be probably, I suppose, the understanding and the comprehension of the new rules, and B would be actually the application. When your heart rate is whatever, up over 180 beats per minute, people, players, all of us are probably struggling in that regard. And um, it's the actual task of it's okay in training that to can can you manage I suppose your frustrations and your behaviours, but when it comes to games, a lot of the teams are struggling, us included. All right, Ronald, great to have you with us this morning. Thanks a million. Cheers, guys. Good to chat. Thanks, Ronald Lagarde. There, giving us some thoughts on uh, essentially the the number ten role and also your responsibilities as a member of a team. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. If you don't have the OTB Sports app already, get onto your app store, search OTB Sports, and you can have it for nothing. A special offer, free, free for 24 hours. Uh, it's always free, don't worry. We've got um, Gary Breen on Shane Duffy. We're going to play that clip, and then afterwards we're going to talk with John Hartson immediately after uh, that. In the meantime, I want to tell you about this. OTB Sports, in partnership with Cadbury FC, have kicked off a brand new series of in-depth chats with some of the biggest names in football, the second episode sees Ian Wright and Saul Campbell sit down for an in-depth chat, which is going to be brought to you on OTB social channels and OTB Sports Radio on Thursday, the 17th of September. So that's the day after tomorrow. Check out cabriefc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. We're back with John Hartson next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB Sports, in partnership with Cadbury FC, have kicked off a brand new series of in-depth chats with some of the biggest names in football. The second of these sees Ian Rice. I love watching great players play. Mm. I love watching great games. And Saul Campbell sit down for an in-depth chat, which will be brought to you on OTB social channels and OTB Sports Radio on Thursday, 17th of September. Check out cadburyfc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. Into sports. 20 yards out, Ursa shoot, don't shoot! Oh, what a goal from Fabinho! Wow! Then get into the all new OTB Sports app. I think when he apologises to me, I probably will say hello to him, yeah. No. Videos, sports news, live scores, interviews. If Fabregas is going to come up to me in the street and give me some of a mouth that he would have given me on a football pitch, what are you going to get a slap? Plus, exclusive content on the OTB Podcast Network. The biggest names in sports, ready when you are. Search OTB Sports on your app store and download it now. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. I think it's a bit of a lazy assumption that, that he won't be able to play that high line. I've never said that he mm. won't be able to do it. I just feel that it's a different challenge to him. And if you're asking me, can he do it? I believe he can do it. Because if you talk about him going in the Premier League, he's playing against top-class centre forwards all the time. Now, I know under Chris Hewton, they defended deeper, but under Potter, it was higher. So he can cope against these players. I've no doubt about that. But there has to be context in that. 
that was a pre-season game for him. He's playing for his country, in, which is effectively a pre-season game in terms of where they are fitness levels. Now, centre-halves, by the very nature, and I'm telling you this through experience, take longer to get that fitness in terms of your movements, having to go quickly up to press the centre-forward, then spinning behind. And he and looked like that anyway, didn't he? Yeah, look at the size of it. Him. It's going to take him games. It would have taken the likes of Richard Dunn. They're those type of centre arts who, who are tipping the scales at maybe 14, 15 stone as opposed to me at 13 stone. It's a massive difference. So he was always going to be sluggish. But I think that we've, it's been too quick to say, like, oh, he, he's vulnerable now. Can he make the adjustment in terms of playing the high line? Yes, of course he can. Because every challenge that he has faced, bear it in mind that horrific injury he got, he comes back stronger. He goes to the championship with Brighton and get promoted. Then everyone's saying, can he do it in the Premier League? Yes, he can. Because he hasn't been embarrassed by any centre forwards in the Premier League. My big concern is that I think it's a brilliant move for Celtic. I genuinely do. I think that he'll get double figures in goals. I said that. I think he'd be a legend up there in a 10 in a row season. My big concern for Ireland is the quality of player that he's playing against and that he does get into a little bit of bad habits. Not because he, he's lazy, because I don't think that, but that he's not up against quality centre-forwards. Every centre-forward... There's no centre-forward in Scotland who, who would play in a Premier League team. None. So he's going to be playing against lesser quality, and that's the concern, because even the likes of Van Dyke come down to Southampton from Celtic with dreadful habits in terms of losing... Not him losing the ball, but not getting into those positions quickly enough because he didn't have to in Celtic because they're not good enough to punish you. John Hartson, good morning to you. <laughs> good morning. How are you getting on? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, all good. So listen, I actually think that what Gary Breen said there makes a lot of sense because the situation all in right. Scotland isn't the same as it was when you were there, when, when the best strikers in the Premier League and from around the world were joining Celtic and Rangers were investing loads of money. Things have changed and, and yet Gary Breen is getting absolutely hammered by uh, Chris Sutton, amongst others. For um, and, and and a bunch of others for for saying what he said is it that outrageous? Well, I don't agree with him. I think we all. <laughs> I know Gary, and uh, I played with Gary Breen at Coventry. He's a good lad, you know. We used to travel in together, and um, I, I think we all get it wrong sometimes. I think he's got this one wrong personally. Um, you know, he says there's no no striker at, at Celtic or in Scotland that could play in the Premier League. Uh, I disagree with that. I think you've got Odson Edward at Celtic who will be training with every day. Um, you know, Celtic, uh, yes, they're out of the Champions League, but, you know, they've got a Europa League um, qualifier next week, which I expect them to get through. So, you know, he, he, he'll have great, um, you know, he'll have competition. Um, and, of course, you know, in terms of uh, Shane Duffy, I think he's, you know, he's, it's, it's a boyhood ambition for him to come and play for Celtic and to represent Celtic. He's now done that. And I think he'll embrace it up here. And I think he'll have a, you know, hopefully, um, you know, he will add to, to, to the strength that Celtic need defensively. And we all know what's, uh, what, what the end goal is this season for Celtic. We all know what they're trying to achieve and the targets that they're trying to get to. Yeah, I, I've seen people mention Edward uh, throughout the last couple of days. Like, I, I'm sure Gary Breen's logic was that he's obviously not going to be playing against Edward because he plays in the same team as him. Like, uh, outside of that, like, uh, Alfredo Morelos obviously would have to be the, the standout striker, John. But is that really it in terms of strikers that will get into the Premier League or, or does the list go on? Well, I, I don't know. Listen, I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to run down. I work for Sky and um, I, I, do a lot of the, um, I do a lot of the Scottish games, you know. But uh, you know, for me, in terms of it's, it's competitive when you're at Celtic because, you know, everybody wants your scalp. It's like, it's like playing for Manchester United or, or one of the top clubs. And when I went to Old Trafford, you know, we, you'd all play like supermen because you knew it was on television. You knew that the game would be highlighted. And um, it's it's not easy at times when you're coming up against against teams that are giving absolutely everything against you, because the fact is, you know, it's on the TV, and um, you know that that is the, the the chance they've got a chance to shine them the other strikers, you know. But there are some decent centre forwards in in Scotland playing at the minute. Kimar Roof has just come from Anderlecht to go and play for Rangers. You just mentioned mm. Morelos there, the big Welsh lad at at Hibs, Christian Deutsch. He's not been capped yet, but he's, he's available to play for Wales. He's been banging in the goals. You've got Marley Watkins, who's just arrived at Aberdeen. Saudi been at Aberdeen from Bristol City. You know, Chris Burke, who played for Birmingham, Cardiff, Rangers at Kilmarnock. 
So, you know, he, Shane Duffy will will need to be, you know, certainly need to defend strongly and you know, and, and as I said, I, I, I don't I don't buy into Gary Breen's comments that there's no top class strikers because when you play for Celtic, everybody wants to scout, everybody wants to beat you. It doesn't seem like the strength and depth is as good as it was when you were there, though. Well, listen, at the end of the day, when I was there, you had some of the best players in the world. You know, you've got the likes of Loudra at Rangers, and, of course, you had Henrik Larsson and the likes of Chris Sutton and and, and these type of strikers around. But, listen, it's, it's, it, it, they are not around now, of course not, but they, they were, they were top-class players. Um, but what I would say is, in, in defence of the Scottish League, is that every tries and likes to run the league down. Um, you know, but for me, Shane Duffy will still have to defend strongly, still have to concentrate, um, you know, in terms of playing at Celtic. Because my point is, everybody wants to beat Celtic. They are the nine-in-a-row champions. You know, I think they've won something like 11 out of the last 12 um, trophies available still got the Scottish Cup obviously to, to contend to win to win another treble this season but you know for me it's um, you know everybody likes to run the Scottish League down and as, as I said it's, it, I, I don't see it that way well, that's fair enough one last question on Shane Duffy um, you know Gary Breen definitely thinks he's capable of playing a high line do Celtic play a high line is that is that exactly what is, his experience is going to be will there be a responsibility on him to to play football because that's what we want from an Ireland perspective well, he's a he's a defender first and foremost. Whether he plays a high line, a, a, you know, a, a, a deeper line, a lot of that will depend on how much of the ball you've got, how much of the ball the opposition's got. You know, he he played in a three at the weekend. He played uh, right of a three. He was outstanding. He didn't put a foot wrong. Uh, Celtic played very very well. Um, scored a great header. You know, he, he looked really assured out there. And he's a fantastic sign-in for Celtic, and we should all be celebrating his sign-in, you know, in terms of what, what is at stake this season. Um, and as I said, it's fantastic for Shane personally. He'll come up here. He, he, he will add a lot to the Celtic dressing room in terms of his leadership skills and everything else. He captains his country. And he's an outstanding sign-in for, for Celtic. It's an, it's an amazing coup for them. And all the fans are, are delighted and and I would think the Republic of Ireland supporters should be delighted and happy for him. He's going to be playing most weeks. He's going to be playing in Europe, hopefully. Um, and the games are competitive. You know, Celtic and Rangers both dropped points already this season. So, you know, not every game is a gimme up here. For sure. It's going to be interesting to see how that develops over the next little while. Uh, we did want to get your take on the opening weekend of the Premier League as well, John. Mixed fortunes mm -hmm. for two of your former clubs. Not a great opening weekend for West Ham, but Arsenal look exceptional. Uh, I guess you're judging them against a team that may well finish 20th, so uh, it's very much too soon to be able to leap to big judgments. But one thing you can say is that the signing of Willian looks to have been a great piece of business by Arsenal in, in the off-season. How important can that be for a team who are trying to charge up the table, bringing in that Premier League experience to bolster their attack? Well, Arsenal's a massive club, and it needs. And I think Gary's <laughs> Gary Breen's an Arsenal fan as well, isn't he? I believe. <laughs> um, so you know, Arsenal need good players. <clears throat> Willian's been uh, outstanding at the time he's been at Chelsea. Um, he'd run his course at Chelsea, of course. They decided that you know they, they he wasn't as important to them. They brought in other good players, as we saw uh, last night against the win against Brighton. Um, but Willian, he's a, he's a great talent. You know, he, he's um, technically he's excellent. He's, he, he can provide, he can score, and uh, when you've got the likes of Lacazette now and Aubameyang and thriving off um, of Willian's services, but um, Arsenal, you know, they need good players, and, and, and hopefully they, they back the manager. He's had some fantastic results. Obviously, they won the FA Cup, and um, lots of people are doubting Arsenal. They think they're not sure whether whether they make top four. The Premier League is ever so strong. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think the really the league really takes shape up until about 10, 15 games into the season. Then you can start to judge. But I would like to see them back. You know, trying to get into them Champions League places. But as I said, uh, it, it's a difficult one because you know Man City and Liverpool are absolute gimmies. Man United have had it. You know, Spurs and Mourinho not had a great start. Um, and of course, you have Chelsea, who who will be 
who will be right up there this year because they have to be up there, the money they've spent. Are you impressed yeah, with Arteta? Hey, Are you impressed with Arteta? I am very impressed. I think one of the things I'm impressed with more than anything else is, is the discipline side of things. You know, you, he, he's come in and uh, if, if you don't fit into his criteria, <clears throat> you know, he's, uh, you're out. You're out of the team. And uh, he trains like he plays. He's, <clears throat> he's worked with the best in terms of one of the best anyway, Pep Guardiola, as an assistant. He, he's, he's ex-Arsenal. He, he knows the club. He knows, you know, the um, what the club is all about, what the supporters want. They want to play nice football, free flow and football, good on the eye. Uh, but also, you know, you look at the record of Arsene Wenger, all them years in the in the Champions League, in the top four. Arsenal need to be up there, um, you know, qualifying for Champions Leagues. I still think they're a while away yet from from winning the league because the other teams are just so so strong. And it's going to take a lot of investment, but definitely Arteta. Um, I, I think a lot of people will share the same opinions as myself. They've been very, very impressed with him. Mm. The, I guess the, the promotion to manager last week as well really indicates a, a big trust in Mikel Arteta that the club have got behind him. Like it's, it's going to, as you say, take 10, 15 games before the, this full season plays out, but. You can already see that, I mean, the trust that the players had in Unai Emery is nothing compared to the cult of the manager that now exists at Arsenal. And it may only be a small thing, but kicking a season off with a community shield even, uh, as small as that is, yeah. seems to have, uh, it, it can't have done any harm, that's for sure. No, not at all. And of course, the FA Cup as well, you know, winning the FA Cup, uh, beating Manchester City, um, it was magnificent. Uh, in the, but they beat Man City in the semi-final, they beat Chelsea in the final, didn't they? Mm. Is that correct? City in the semi-final. City yeah. in the semi-final and, and Chelsea in the final. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, they, they, that's, that's, you look at it, they struggled uh, in terms of the league to, to, beat, to beat the teams in and around them. But, you know, in terms of the cup competitions, I think he's got them, he's got them very well organised, you know, for them one-off games and he showed he can do that. Now it's just a case of doing it for a longer period of time and being more consistent in the Premier League. But, no, it's uh, it's a great start for him, the Community Shield. You could argue, it, you know, it's, it's probably not one of the biggest tournaments that, that, that they sort of uh, target. But it's, 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 a, it's a trophy and it's a great start to the season and uh, they would rather win it than, than play poorly and, 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 and lose it, you know? Uh, well, one question I'd have about what we've seen maybe in the opening weekend, and I think it's a trend that we've seen over the last little while, John, is about cohesion between attacking units. So, of course, it's a while now since we've seen a, a good duo up front for Premier League teams. But what we're starting to see and what we have seen are good trios up front. I think Arsenal are probably tapping into it a little bit. We all know that Manchester City and Liverpool have been doing it for the last little while. Uh, I'm not sure how much of Chelsea you saw last night, but that is going to be one of the more interesting questions of the entire year about how they take all this talent that they have up front and turn it into a unit that can actually fire week in, week out. Well, the thing is, that's why they're probably playing a three. That's why a lot of teams now are playing 4 three, three, so they can get all their talent in the, in the one team. You know, rather than leaving top players out, um, waiting for the centre forwards to, to particularly have a poor run or to go a couple of games and then swapping them over, they tend to play like you know. Look at Arsenal; they played, the, you know, the likes of Aubameyang generally plays on the left, and then they'll have one through the middle, and it's been Pepe on the right. So that's how they've been lining up. Same we know about Liverpool, of course, with Firmino and that. And Liverpool do it exceptionally well with Firmino drops in them little pockets and it, it, it allows it allows um, Mane or, or Salah, they're so clever, you know, they, they can fill in different positions, the movement is excellent, one moves out, another player moves in, but no, I just think that's one of the big reasons because all these players are extremely talented and it's one way of playing with a three, of getting all your talented strikers, you know, in the team at the same time and of course then you, you've got to You've got to be um, organised defensively when when other teams break on you. But a lot of these top teams now as well, they they press press very very well. And Jose Mourinho was disappointed with Spurs' press uh, the other the other um, uh, game there the other mm -hmm. night. So 
you know, for me, these top teams with three as well, it's probably easier to press when one goes, you know, that's a trigger for then the midfielders to come in and, and get that high press. And um, it's probably easier to press in a three, um, but one's got to be a trigger. And you see Arsenal do that, except especially Aubameyang, the way that he presses high, you know, he, he's a credit to himself and a credit for other teams that, that want to learn how to press. You know, he, he shows the way in terms of that hard work, um, not just when you've got the ball, but also without the ball. I think that's what Arteta has taken from Man City in terms of that hard work and that defensive that defensive responsibilities without the ball, where Man City are brilliant with yeah. the ball, but even better without it. Well, what do you make of those Jose Mourinho comments, actually, on, on Sunday, John? It definitely felt that he wasn't willing to take all the blame for the fact that the players weren't pressing well. I mean, surely the manager has to take some semblance of blame for that. Well, yeah, um, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of... Um, Jose Mourinho is Jose Mourinho, isn't he? You know, he, he's basically... He, he will call it if he's not happy with his players. And a lot of people have come in this week and said... Um, I've heard a lot of comments, people saying, well, he might lose the dress, you know, which is absolutely nonsense. If, if you are a player... And, and, and you're a professional and you want to win games and you want to you know, win games along with your manager and for your manager, then that, that's what you should do. You, because the manager has dug one or two of the players out, then that doesn't mean that you have to turn against the manager and, and what you say, not work for him, not, not put a fully, full shift in for him the following week because he's dug you out one week, he's called you lazy, he's called you not fit. Accept it, accept it and move on and learn from it and get better. And take it as a, as 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 um, you know as as a criticism, but something that you are going to going to act uh, in terms of that criticism. You're going to you're going to do better the next time. All this, you know, um, because it's Jose Mourinho, and he has moved around in recent years in terms of club to club to club. He's sacked at three or four of his last four clubs or whatever he's been at: Real Madrid, Chelsea, Manchester United, and now he'll probably you know he, he, if he keeps going. Um, if he doesn't achieve what Daniel Levy wants him to get into the, the top four, didn't make the top four last season. So at the end of the day, you know, he's only on a two-year contract, I believe, Jose Mourinho. But when people say, oh, because he's dug a few of the players out and he's given them criticism publicly, well, react to that. React to that in a positive way. Don't, don't go sulking and think, I won't play for him. Listen, the modern-day player, that's what they do now, unfortunately. But that's, that's the, the power of the player as well. John, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. OK, boys, welcome. Always great to talk to you. That's Sean Hart in there giving us some thoughts on uh, Gary Breen and Jose Mourinho and everything in between, including the situation at Arsenal. If you want to get in touch, 0879-180-180 is the number. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. It's time for the papers. OTBAM. Yeah, 22 minutes past nine, the uh, front page of otbsports.com. It's not like riding a, bar, a bike. Mark Lawrenson on Liverpool's sluggishness. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I didn't know what that would have been. Uh, Mark and Bernard Brogan was like trying to keep the tide out. That's Mark O'Shea. Uh, he's part of our piece with Bernard Brogan coming up. He bossed the game. Is Ross Byrne now Sexton's understudy for Ireland? Yes, would be the conclusion that uh, comes from the conversation we just had with Ron O'Gara and Hamilton facing FIA investigation over Breonna Taylor t-shirt. He's had been defended by Mercedes this morning. So I've run you through the newspaper headlines, the Irish Times, picture of Owen Farrell and Johnny Sexton. Obviously, they won't be coming up against each other this weekend when Saracens and Leinster renew their rivalry at the uh, Aviva. But uh, apparently he's playing the Johnny Sexton role in training by uh, being the opposition number 10. Uh, this story is basically Owen Farrell is training this week because it's in all the papers. Um, but, you know, uh, let's build it up. Saracens have been targeting this game for eight months. That is true. Uh, McBride knows threat Saracens will pose. So this is the scrum coach talking about the improvements in particular that Andrew Porter's made in the set piece. And uh, Andrew Porter was brilliant uh, at the weekend. And he then becomes the first female president of an Irish province. That is uh, in Connacht. They also have match reports from yesterday's uh, Premier League games. Wolves didn't get none of your love at the start of the, the show, even though they were tuning up inside the first 10 minutes against Sheffield United. Uh, oh, and you were like, no, no, I don't care about them. My Ledger Heartbreak, <laughs> this is a story about uh, the jockey Shane Cross, who um, 
was uh, tested positive for COVID and so therefore missed the St. Ledger. Return of crowds at Warwick Hinges and Key Talks. They're talking about a much smaller number of people being allowed in to watch games in England. The um, back page of the London Times is uh, the Rhys James celebration after his goal. Gave uh, Chelsea a 2-1 lead and they ultimately they win that game 3-1. Uh, fights broken out between Joffre Archer and uh, Michael Holding about um, how committed the English cricketers are to Black Lives Matter and uh, the capacity might be two and a half thousand which is going to end up being quite important in England in terms of the amount of money that the Premier League has to give to the rest of the football pyramid. It's going to be very interesting to see exactly what happens with that. Reese Lightning, uh, not a bad goal and tab of the morning to you, good headline. Um, Rhys James with an absolute screamer from about 35 yards to uh, restore the lead, as we said. Nuno gives his Wolves a big thumbs up. Um, Nuno Espirito Santo celebrated his new contract with a season opening win, but challenged his stars to be braver. Jose faces backlash over lazy, unfit jibes. I mean, what the hell did he expect? Unless this is all part of his master plan or he's just uh, a narcissist, who knows? Connor's a GEA celebrity, get him in immediately. Tyrone great Owen Mulligan is called for the red hands to bring Conor McKenna on board immediately. What do you think of that, Owen? Straight in? Straight in. I would have thought if he's fit and raring to go, it's a wild card that they need. I mean, Tyrone don't want to pussyfoot around and not win in All-Ireland, you know. Like, he is a player who can, maybe not will, but who can give them an edge. And if there's any chance of it happening, you have to throw him in right away because no second chances, as Anthony Cunningham said earlier on. Uh, this um, is an exclusive on the Paul Lennon story. Delaney's 15-year reign cost FAI 7.5 million. Uh, the Star is reporting this morning that John Delaney pocketed an average of 500,000 per year in total pay and benefits during his 15 years as FAI CEO. So remember there was um, much song and, and dance made about his uh, salary reduction from 400 grand to 360 grand uh, in the final years of his controversial reign. But he was obviously in charge for 15 years. During this time, he claimed 7.52 million in salary and benefits, even though the sporting body was in crisis from 2008. That's Paul Lennon's exclusive in the Star this morning. Stars fume over Jose's lazy jibes, and Duffy views are bullshit. This is Pierre van Hoydink, Hoydink, saying that Gary Breen is talking nonsense. Um, I mean, I think they're all missing the point that the league used to be much better than it is now, right? All this, yeah, well, it didn't do Henry Larson any harm. He's like, well, no, because Henry Larson was playing at a time when it was much easier for Scottish clubs to afford better players. And in particular, Rangers had world-class talent on their books. Yeah, for, for sure. Like, I, I, I definitely think that, that, that that's part of it as well. And, like, I mean, you can get into the semantics of the fact that there are a number of strikers who probably would make Premier League teams. But I guess the, the one who would definitely make a Premier League team actually plays with... Shane Duffy, which uh, if you want to get into the semantics, he can't play against him either. If, if you want to become well, the Premier League, playing every day in training, you know. Tra yeah, true, I suppose. Yeah, he's talking about practice. Irish Independent back page suspended Farrell plays Sexton role in training. Uh, he's not being Johnny Sexton; he's just being on Farrell playing a ten for the opposition. Added the Saracens head coach, um, and uh, Rory McIlroy and Harry Diamond. Uh, we're going to talk about winged foot in New York. There's um, some good crack going on there. Uh, United plan to target Bale if Sancho deal falls flat. There's a Gareth Bale is open to us. Are Manchester United open to paying 360 grand a week, having just got rid of the money that was being soaked up by a not very happy, injury-prone, attacking player in Alexis Sanchez? Are they going to repeat the mistake? Uh, and then Maldini Rovers game scares Milan. Paolo Maldini does not like the sound of Tala in September. Uh, the Examiner. It looks like we might get every game broadcast in the TV championship or in the GA championship, according to John Fogarty. Story haven't seen this anywhere else either. TV companies way up broadcasting entire championship, and also a picture there of David Clifford, who is back for East Kerry this weekend. So they were able to win without him at the weekend. On they were poor enough game, but uh, they got the job done. So he'll be back uh, not this weekend, but the weekend after. So uh, an extra weekend's rest after Mid Kerry went to extra time. So everything is in East Kerry's favour for that county final. GA president elect and. Uh, uh, celebrity friend Shane Lowry at um, the Gaelic Park in New York. Obviously, Shane is there for the golf this week. And uh, Kingston, I won't place players in club versus county di dilemma. So, um, Kieran Kingston has actually discovered some new players as a result of the split season and says it's a good thing and he's not going to call anybody in to train with him if they're still in club championships. So, um, I think most managers are fairly open minded and straightforward about this. With your, if you're with the club, you're with the club. 
And then there's a good story here from Stephen Barry, Cork Ladies football manager Evie Fitzgerald expressed major reservations about the All-Ireland Championships going ahead. I've made a reservation about the championship as it stands in terms of health and safety, not so much the COVID, but the fallout from the COVID. If we don't have showers and hot food, we've girls travelling an average of 75 miles a night. Anya Terry will be driving from Castletown Bear in the middle of winter and we're not getting any answers. I'm blue in the face from talking to the LGFA about what's the situation if and how do we counteract this. It's going to be very dangerous, I feel. This is definitely a point that people have been making to us as well. Sitting in a car for three hours after a match or a training session. Um, I know some Ulster rugby clubs are travelling from Donegal to Belfast for matches. It's a five hour round trip in the car. You won't have a shower. Uh, is that really the right thing for everybody to do? I've already done those papers. And then back page to the Herald for you. Uh, scared of the hoops. Rovers game, a concern from Milan great Maldini. If they could pull it off, if they could just pull it off. Archer hits at it, holding and insisting the support uh, Black Lives Matters. James and Zuma rock Brighton. And US Consortium step up to buy efforts to buy West Ham. So maybe West Ham were just selling their prize assets uh, to get some last minute cash in before they actually sell the club to some Americans. So maybe that would be good for uh, West Ham not to have the current owners. Anything you want to talk about there, on? Just one quick one before we wrap up this morning in the papers anyway. Anthony Stokes uh, has had his departure from Livingston confirmed and there has been quite a statement from Livingston's head of football operations, David Martindale. Uh, he said, Stokesy has been in training for approximately four weeks now, and it's fair to say that we both knew that there was going to be a lot of work to be done to get Anthony into top shape to play in premiership football. Now listen to this. In all honesty, it's not quite worked out in terms of the on-field ball work and intense training schedule that we put in place. He is struggling to adapt to two to three hours per day on the AstroTurf surface. We all know it doesn't and won't suit everyone. Of course, Anthony knew the surface we had in place, but each player adapts to that differently and you don't know how your body will feel adapting to it until you've been out there and played or trained on it frequently. We know it isn't for everyone and sadly, that's been the case for Anthony. Anthony Stokes has left Livingston because he can't train on a plastic pitch. Uh, right. I want to tell you about what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today. It's Queenie's How's the Head with Pat Short at noon at one o'clock. It's OTB Gold, Joe meeting Ruby Walsh. The Dadcast is live from two. And then it's our Paddy Power Premier League preview, a bonanza of big names. Gordon Strachan joining Will and Kenny Cunningham. Jamie Redknapp and Phil Thompson also confirmed for that. Nathan Stewie Byrne, Kenny Cunningham, Stephen Doyle and John Duggan are involved in the crappy quiz at four o'clock. Paddy Power Half Hour, Will and End are going to be joined by Paddy Power himself and Gary Breen. And then David Myler meets Wes Brown at 5.15, ex-teammates. And then uh, OTB Gold tonight is inside Park Harrington's gaff from 6 o'clock. Park Harrington does a version of Cribs for OTB. What is there about that that you don't want to hear? That's coming your way on OTB Sports Radio. Download the app now. Search OTB Sports in the App Store. And a reminder, of course, OTBM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Bernard Broken has a new book out. He's been in the studio. We're bringing the first of three parts today. This is uh, focusing on the Kerry rivalry. Have a look and enjoy. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. All right, I'm very happy. All right, I'm very happy to say Bernard Brogan is here to talk to us about his new book, Bernard Brogan, The Hill. There's the copy of it. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming Thanks, in. No, I appreciate it. Last time you were on with this, you had the full beard. You've obviously <laughs> decided that that's yeah, not I, for life. Um, just yeah, for lockdown. We had, just lockdown. We had to kind of um, get back to business, get back to work, present ourselves accordingly, and uh, yeah, just get on with things. I think um, the initial COVID period, everyone kind of rallied and the energy was high, and now it's kind of trying to find that balance about life as a norm, as norm, you know, and trying to get get about your business and, and get through the week, you know? Yeah, it's not, it's not as much crack as we thought it might be when it was like, oh, this is going to be a few weeks, everything's going to be grand, let's have some banana bread. Now it's like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, everyone, there was massive energy to start and great kind of campaigns around charity and great kind of social media content and everyone was really hyped up and then there's been several different emotions over the last few weeks and I think... It's tough for people, you know. I think the schools getting back open are massive and creches and stuff like that. Um, especially my house, having the having the kids um, in school or in creche is helps us get about our day. You yeah. Know? So um, it's still still not um, normal, but um, we're trying to get back to a bit of a bit of it. Speaking of kids, you've had the book out now. You were saying since last Monday, it's a little bit like going to a parent teacher meeting when everybody's reviewing the book. How has that ex uh, experience been like for you? Yeah, it's pretty positive feedback so far um, obviously very nervous um, when you put out anything and obviously a book is, um, is, a, is, is a piece of work that you kind of can be very nervous about because it's, it's my story you know what I mean and you're waiting to hear what people think about it um, 
And I definitely, the reason I, I did it, I suppose, I definitely felt that my, my story was different to what people maybe had a perception of me. Um, I, I worked very hard for everything that I got in sport and, and sometimes in the media or and, and in, in press you'd, you'd think that I had, a, had a, the golden journey even though I had here so much success um, but we worked hard for it and, and, and I, uh, I worked hard for, for every match day I got in that blue jersey. You didn't make it as a kid, as an underage player at all? No, I um, obviously went to all the trials like, like every aspiring um, Dublin footballer who's under 14, under 15, myself and Ross McConnell um, coming out from Plunkett's most, most years to try and represent and get a, get a nod. Ross got a bit of a, a run underage um, but when it came to business a uh, minor um, both of us were, 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 were sent home. Um, I wasn't big enough, I wasn't, didn't stand out enough. Um, and I actually played a little bit with the, the minor hurlers, I actually made the minor hurling team. And I uh, didn't actually play in the championship, I was on the bench against Kilkenny, were beaten in the first round. But um, yeah, I just kept at it. Um, as I was saying, the book having Alan there kind of just excelling and um, probably gave me the, the hunger to get after it. And um, kept with it and played, started playing some good stuff with the, with the club, I got a nod. Um, I was brought in actually under Tommy Lyons in the first year, um, 21s when Alan, when Alan captained the All Ireland winning team. I was only brought in the All Ireland semi final um, and just didn't play. He was on the bench, just feeling the part. I think Tommy Lyons was, was, was gearing up to, to bring me in. Um, and then I broke down to my first cruciate, which was um, a disaster. And then obviously spent a year out. And uh, But like in, in any injury I've ever had, I always look at it and try and say, how do I become out? come better? How do I come out of this injury? With so hang on, you didn't, well, you, at 19 you were thinking that already, straight away? Yeah, well I knew that I was small, I knew, I knew what was setting, setting me back and I had a chance now to, because when you're training every week, twice a week and you're, and you're playing matches at the weekend, you can't find time to get after something, so I just kind of, I don't know where it came across my head or whatever, I just said, right, I need to do things a little bit differently. Um, Straight away, so when the injury happened, like cause in the book it's clear the injury is one of the best things that ever happened to you, because mm. it's a reset for everything you've ever done, mm. and uh, like I don't know if it's a renewal of focus or it's this has been taken away from me. I need mm. to double down. On it. Like, what do you remember what the mindset was like? I don't know why. Yeah, I, I, I was obviously very disappointed, but I, I was quite optimistic about it. I was quite positive. Um, I don't know what, why, where I, I, I found that. Um, maybe in, in the upbringing and, and uh, playing, been around my dad so much. Um, but yeah, I looked at it and said, right, I have this is going to be six or seven months. Um, I was kind of in this start of the Dublin setup. I had the best. I was down with Ray Moore, and I had been in with good physios. I had all that kind of positive environment. Um, and I talked to Barry Cattle, had just done his couple of years pre previous and he had um, a chat to him and he had a kind of a, a timeline schedule that um, Trevor Giles had gave to him about his milestones that uh, no, no, no limp, off crutches, one leg, one crutch, um, no limp, um, start to jog, full flexion, all these kind of important milestones for your recovery and I had um, Trevor Giles' um, recovery times and Barry Gall's and that was that, that was the game all I needed. I just wanted to, to do better, to get after their dates, to see where I was. So I had that kind of comparison. I think it's a real nice thing to have if anyone... Sometimes it can be a lonely place and it's, a, it's kind of a never-ending journey to cruise yeah. it or, or a, long, a shoulder or a long-term injury. Um, and a lot of people don't recover from it because they don't know what they have to get out. They're told to rehab, but... What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah, you know I mean? it's not sitting on the couch. Yeah. Right? I mean, it is a little bit of sitting on the couch, but there's also actually active stuff you can do. So you're 19 when that happens, is that 19, right? 19, yeah. Yeah. Um, came through that. Um, a different... A different man. I, 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 I took a bit of a growth spurt just naturally around that time when I was 18 or 19. I was in the middle of that, and I um, went after the weights a lot. I, I, I loved the gym um, and felt that if I could bring a bit of power to my game uh, inside. I was always the small guy in the inside forward line. I said, if I bring a bit of power, I'll be able to offer something. So I hit the gym hard for um, a few months and came back uh, a different animal. We've all been watching The Last Dance over lockdown. Uh, the bit where you get rejected, uh, did that, or, like, was any of what Michael Jordan was like? To, uh, okay. Was there a little bit of that from underage, under 15? Because, you know, famously, Henry Shefflin doesn't make it really at underage either and always used that as like a little chip on his shoulder. Were you... Were Absolutely, you, were you yeah. quietly chippy? Yeah, yeah. I always felt I had enough. I had decent self-confidence um, and I felt that I had enough football to, to add value to the team. So um, I was going to prove them wrong. I think I've, <laughs> I tried to prove a lot of people wrong throughout my whole journey um, with, with Dublin's, but um, 
Yeah, definitely. And, and as I said, having Alan there and, and seeing the dynamic that of, happen, of what happens on match day and seeing like Barry Gahill and Jason Sherlock, knowing a few of the characters around and just seeing the environment, um, I knew I wanted to be out there um, and that, that, I, that I, could, I could get there if I, if I worked hard at it. Um, it wasn't going to come naturally for me. I had to go away and obviously I wanted to become really accurate. Um, so I started doing a lot of practicing myself, a lot of... Um, I bought a bag of balls. My dad bought me a bag of balls. It was just one of the... Uh, in recovery from the cruciate? Yeah, yeah. So it was actually... It's your right knee, isn't that right? my right knee, yeah. And I remember I was, I was reading something there a while ago and Paul Galvin was over in a club in London and they were asking about what, how do you become this, how do you do that? And he said, how many of us here own a bag of footballs? Like, And they said, none of us. So how are you going to be a good footballer? Like, what you're, All you're doing is the showing up on a Thursday night for, and you probably only have... How many touches do you get in a, in a training game? You make it 30 or 40 touches of the ball. Yeah. Um, so how can you excel? So um, that was a night that resonated with me when I read that read that article. Because I was the same. I said, for me to be better, I need to get the ball in my hands. I need to be striking the ball thousands of times to get that to get that um, that pure strike and the one I wanted. You know. And so you were kicking with your left while you were recovering yeah. with the right as well. And that that's where the accuracy off the left foot comes from. Yeah, exactly. And that, that was it. Use this as an opportunity to strengthen my left foot. So I, I was actually able to do a month of just kicking off my left foot. I was able, strong enough on my right foot. I couldn't ping, I couldn't kick because obviously the cruise the lower knee. Um, so I was just striking all the ball off my left, and I was strengthening my right foot because I was obviously land, I was I was planting planting on yeah. it for my strike. Um, and yeah, like that, that was that I kind of came away with um, strengthening my left foot and put on a bit of muscle power as well. So what year is that? God, what year was that? Um, that was two thousand and. I think. And when you make the Dublin team? That was 2004. Sorry, that was that Dublin won the All Ireland 2003. Alan's year it was that it was the end of that year. I did the cruciate and into the following year. Um, and I played a bit of under 21s with Dublin the following year. My last year 21s, we won a Leinster, um, but wasn't overly inspiring. I was just coming back from a, a cruciate injury, but I did get a, a nod. Um, to the seniors then after that. Okay, because it's that's the first part of the, the um, conversation we're going to have is the rivalry with Kerry um, because they're the team of the decade in the them and Tyrone mm. are the team of the, the decade in the noughties when um, at that stage they're playing a quality of football that you guys just can't match. What was special about that Kerry team? I think they had footballers all over the park. Um, everyone was there, everyone was comfortable on the ball, everyone was quick, everyone was strong. Um, and they had a belief as well. I think big thing is, is having the belief you're going to get over the line. Um, and they had they just had such talent, and they 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 had guys who could score from anywhere as well. Um, so it's just their their breadth and even their bench and stuff like that. They had that they had that full full package back then. Yeah. One of the players who could score from anywhere, I'm delighted to say, is on the line. Mark O'Shea. Good afternoon to you. How you doing? Good, Jar. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Mark. Hi, Bernard. How are things with you? Good now. Good now. How good was Bernard, Mark? Uh, look, Bernard was Bernard for me was the he was the toughest I've ever come up against because you know it was it was uh, I was lucky enough when I started off that I didn't have to mark him the first few years because uh, he was out in the wing and uh, we came up against Dublin in zero four zero seven zero nine and uh, I think zero nine was Bernard's first year there but. Um, after that, then he moved in towards the corner, and uh, Bernard was phenomenal. Both feet, and he, uh, just listening to him there talking about the work that he did on his on his weaker weaker foot, um, he, he put in serious effort. You could you could see that. And the thing about Bernard was, you could be marking him for 60, 69, 70 minutes, and if we were on top in the middle of the field, maybe the the ball he wasn't getting the service that 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 he would have liked. But he was just one of those players that you had to keep your eye on for the full 70, 75 minutes. I remember one of the games, it was a National League game, I think it was after Dublin beat us in 11. But uh, I was on Bernard and it was one of those games which was actually going okay because most of the games I played against Bernard, most of them didn't go according to plan. But this game was going all right and it was. I think we were level, level peg, pegging coming down the stretch. and. Uh, a ball was kicked in anyway, and Bernard was facing in towards the, the Davin stand on the Cusick side. And again, on the left, he just took it. And he was a very clever forward insofar as that the way he made his runs, he, he did them, he did those lateral runs where he wasn't coming out too far. He was he was he was making the runs where he was kind of half turned uh if he did receive it. 
you know, a point was on or maybe there was a pass on. And that game anyway, in particular, I remember the ball came in and Bernard took it and he turned on to his right and the ball just sailed over the bar. So it was always a t- And then I suppose when, when my brother Dara retired, you know, midfield was an easy area for Kerry. And when, when, when Dublin were going so well, you had such a, such a driving force in the middle of the field and then you were faced with the task of trying to mark him when there was a, a supply of ball coming in and uh, it was it was tr- it was like trying to keep the tide out trying to mark him he was that good but again look he had all the skills he, he was able to win a ball over his head that's the big thing with a forward the hardest forwards to mark are the fellas that can win their own dirty ball um you know kick with your with your right kick with your left and you know the big thing about him as well and this is something that i i really noticed about bernard is when when, when i had the ball and when i was coming out with the ball the pressure he put on you when you were coming out with the ball, it was it was very hard thing to do. You knew if you were, if you were bringing it into the tackle against him, that you really had to hold on to that ball. So look, it was um, as I say, I was I was the unlucky uh, victim in the carry setup who had the the unenviable task of, of trying to mark him. Um, zero eleven was the first year, thirteen, uh, thirteen, and then there was I think it was fifteen. I was injured. I tore my hamstring. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, my, the day of my birthday, <laughs> I was 36 on the on the, um, on the National League final, and I was Mark and Bernard, and that that'll be a nightmare that'll that, that's still with me this day. <laughs> but uh, no, look, he was he was phenomenal player, and look to bow out at the top, what a way to, to bow out, and uh, he deserves all the plaudits. Can we go back to one of the games that you, you guys did win? It's um, the 2007 All-Ireland semi-final. It's a game that people don't really talk about that much, but actually, watching back then, uh, just this morning, I was flicking through it to kind of see, it's a really good game. You guys, like, quite close to beating that Kerry team, who go on to, to win the All-Ireland final again. Um, this is Padaché's first year, I think, in charge. How close do you guys feel you were, Bernard, to actually winning that game in retrospect? Um, well, all I can say is my experience. I was out marking um, Tomas O'Shea, and obviously Tomas at the height of his powers. Um, I was more chasing him back as, um, as much as going forward. Um, but we were in the game. Um, I think if you ask me honestly, did I believe we were going to get over the line? Did they have that when it came down to the, the last few minutes? Were we going to pull it out? I think that's the difference between when you have a bit of success and you don't. That intrinsic belief that. Um, the mark and the team, the, the team would have had to, to, to get over the line. There was a huge respect, um, no doubt, between um, Dublin and Kerry, uh, and Kerry took that game very seriously. But I would say inside them, they said that we bring this down to the wire, um, we we'll, we'll get over the line, and that maybe is maybe something that shifted. I don't know um, what Mark thinks, but um, well, because like I, I don't know if they did respect you as much as they ultimately come to. And I remember, I remember one stage, Alan. I think it was Alan or someone said that I don't know. Obviously, we we would be great pals with, with a lot of lads, and 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 have been and were when we were been beaten, and 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 still are when we had a, had a few wins over them. Um, so that relationship is 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 very respectful. I remember Alan or someone saying that um, someone maybe said something to the media about we've, we've a lot of respect. For the for the Dublin lads, they're lovely lads, and Alan said to me, he says, "Of course we're lovely lads when they're beating us every time." He says, "Let's see what they're like when we get over them." And in time, we we got a few victories. But in fairness, they've been <laughs> they've been humble that way as well. But they were always gracious winners, um, and we I love I love playing playing against the lads. Um, and Mark, he's been too kind to me there. I, I, had, I had a lot of tough times, and I ended up 70 minutes without a score most times because Mark was out in front of me. Or he he's spoiled in the book. In the he's, your, he's your toughest marker, and that's what you said in the book. Yeah, like Mark was an ultimate footballer. He probably, well, he wasn't wasting the full back line, but he, he could have played centre forward if he wanted to. So he had he'd balance. Like, and I just obviously watched him back in, in, in his last few months, writing, writing the book and going through the, um, the past glories and past games and, and watching especially Dublin Kerry ones and um, when you're watching Mark I found I couldn't go by, I found it very hard to go by him because he'd so much balance that if it, you, usually what you're trying to do in size you get the ball and you turn him on and, and power past him but I had to learn to kick over the shoulder with Mark because he's obviously he's a big man um, but he, you weren't able to lose him you know so that's why I love playing against him because he was he was you're, you're pitting yourself against the best you know um, and and we had epic battles. Some Mark got the better of, and the other time I got a few scores off him, and he'd say that I got the better of him. But it was um, I always I always loved that day, that day out against Kerry. Um, the, that team in the noughties, Mark, you guys must have had a lot of confidence in it. Like, 
there was a flakiness that, that that Dublin team had been accused of having because of what happened in the Mayo game in 06 when they'd had a big lead. There was, I think it goes all the way back to Kildare scoring a couple of goals after half time in the Leinster final just after the, was that 2000? Mm. Um, so did you just automatically assume we're Kerry, we're going to win these games? And I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but like the way that the Cork hurlers would always kind of go in a couple of points up against most opponents with the collars up thinking, actually, you know, this team are going to have to put on the greatest performance they've ever done if they're going to beat us today. I, I don't think uh, there was an arrogance about us. I think that uh, I just think we had confidence in our own ability um, in the in the team that we had at the time, um, and that's you know, like even even the team that uh, Bernard was a part of in zero seven that was a that was a very good Dublin team, and the thing about it was you know, and I think it happened in twenty eleven when they made the breakthrough. That's when they started to believe. Geez, we have a, we have a serious team here. But I think that you know, with every kind of with every year, with every game that you play, you have to have an element. look. Stephen Cluxton will go down as the greatest goalkeeper of all times, um, one of the most influential footballers of all times. But I think Stephen made a mistake in the zero seven game. Uh, it was either the zero seven or zero four, which 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 got us over the line really. And if Dublin had made the breakthrough that year. Maybe that was the belief that would have would have would have brought, and so maybe, maybe they'd have had more medals than what they have, you know. And they they they've, they've, they've enough. I think they need to say the love now is small, but but um, no, it's just I, I think what it was, and I think Bernard will agree with this. In in when you, when you go out to face an opponent uh, or face a team, you look around your your dressing room, you look what you you have. I mean, in our team at the time. You know, there was myself, there was Mike McCarthy, there was Tom O'Sullivan, there was Tomas, there was Seamus Moynihan, Aidan O'Mahony, there was Darren. Not bad. Was <laughs> That's not a bad six, is it? Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, and I am sure if you ask Bernard, he'll say the exact same thing about the the, the current Dublin setup and the la in the last six or seven, eight, nine years. And then the fellas, you know, that come off the bench to finish off the game. Um, there and, and, and that's, if you look, say, back at the last... The last say you know since 20 certainly 2013 on that's where dublin have had it over kerry is that their their starting 15 you know has been has been outstanding and then they have the, you know the talent that comes off the bench to come to come on and finish the job but i don't think for a second it was it was it was arrogance but what i do think happened was that you just you have such confidence in your own team that that certainly worked a few points to you, and uh, I think I think yeah, that yeah. it's fair to say that those, those defeats are really important in terms of the long term evolution of what Dublin really become. What do, what do you remember from the start of the Earwigs game? Like how much of that do you remember? Did you ever watch it back again? No, never. <laughs> no. I just similar to to, to what we spoke about it. Just a, a game where that belief isn't there, and when you when you have that mindset and something doesn't go against you. Um, you can fall down, a uh, spiral down, a uh, drain very quickly, you know. Um, and once you get once you once you get behind, you're, you're chasing it. You're trying to force things. You're trying to put balls in to get a goal. You're trying to be, be, be sneaky instead of what, what Dublin have done over the last while, or any good team does. They stick to what they know. They, they stick to what, what works for them, and they keep going at it. And eventually, they get opportunities. Like Barcelona in soccer, well, the old Barcelona in soccer, yeah. they kept on playing the ball and they keep on looking for the gaps, and then they find a the gap. You know what I mean? Um, and it does take that, as Mark says there, in 2011, like we probably shouldn't have won that game. Do you know what I mean? If you actually look back and said, if you played that game a thousand times, or the last ten minutes a thousand times, did we, how many times did we get over the line? A bit of brilliance from, a bit of grit, a bit of luck, and a bit of brilliance from Kev Mack, and a few good scores after that, do you know what I mean? So, yes, that tips the scales then of confidence, and, and you kind of feel, okay, now we're here, now we've done it. Even though it was only just one incident that makes a difference to, to a team of 30 people, but that, that's what it takes to win and to have that belief. And as, as Mark said, in, in the noughties when, when Kerry and throughout any decade when, when, and, and, and they will come again, Kerry, it's about just getting that bit of belief and to do that, you need to get win and to, to get that win and to get that win, you need a little bit of luck. You need, you need all of the variables to come together. Um, it's not one thing, but definitely you need you need to get over the line um, to, to drive that confidence. It's a catch-22 situation for a lot of teams, though. You can't get the confidence until you win. You can't win without the confidence. So we, we got into the Pat Gilroy era with your brother a little bit later on and kind of how that how that whole thing happened. But um, I do want to just talk about the, the, the defeat in, in 09 a little bit. Mark, if you can talk to us about... So that's, for people who are unfamiliar with it, this is a, a carry team that are bedraggled, that are going nowhere. There's been rancor in the camp. They've fluked their way to Croke Park. 
and they're all set up for Dublin to put the, the last stake through the heart of this Kerry team and finish them off. And I think it's one ten to two points after about 15 minutes and Kerry are playing some of the best football we've ever seen. So what do you remember about that game? Uh, me, is it, Jack? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, there was a bit of controversy before the game. I think you two had a, uh, had a concert that weekend in Croke Park and Croke Park had, had a huge, uh, they were under huge pressure to lay the sod um, prior to the game. And, um, but, you know, I suppose we were in a situation where uh, we, we had gone through the back door Nobody was giving us a chance. We barely got over the line against Sligo in our backyard inside in Tralee and Ossestag Park. Um, and we beat, we beat Antrim above in Tullamore. So we were going up to Croke Park, but we just felt, you know, look, we have nothing to lose. Uh, every, every, everything, everyone is, is back in the dubs. Um, and again, we, we, we knew, you know what, if, if there's just something, some small little thing that will ignite it, and uh, we got a great start that day, it has to be said. Uh, up the field, Mike Mack made a great burst up the field, um, passed it to the Gooch, back the net. And again, that kind of just ignited the season for us. It was that jolt, that kickstart that we needed. And uh, I don't think we looked back after that. But it's, it was just, look, I think that game was a kind of a, you know, you, there's games that you play that you say, Do you know what, everything just went right there and nothing went right for the opposition. That was that was one of those games. It, it the reverse happened to Kerry in two thousand and one against Mead, where Mead came out absolutely annihilated Kerry. Um, it doesn't make the losers a bad team. It, it didn't make Kerry a bad team in two thousand and one. Uh, they, they they were a bad team on the day, but you know the talent that was within that Kerry team that came back afterwards and won all Ireland's. But there's no doubt that when you lose a game like that. The, the, the self-reflection that you, you do, the, the, you scrutinise yourself, your teammates. Um, I know from talking to Bernard and Alan that Pat Gilroy, I think he quoted, you know, that they looked like startled earwigs. But look, that, that, was, that was just kind of what, you know, one of those days and it was, it was a freak. And I think everything just went right for us on the day and it was, it was what kind of got us going again. And, you know, we, we went on then to win the All-Ireland that year. But... Um, you know, I, I just I don't see it as a Kerry totally dominating uh, double. It was just one of those days that everything went right, as I say. It's funny though. There was that period of, of games where you absolutely annihilate them. That day, you you had the confidence to see off their late surge in in 07 as well. From a Kerry perspective, what was different about the Dublin team that you faced in 2011? Then 2011, I suppose there was the, the they weren't they were never going to lie down. They just kept going, kept going, kept going. Uh, we were four points up, I think, with 65 minutes gone on the clock. And uh, they they just, you know, when, when when Kevin got the goal, you know, you knew that you were, you were, like I remember Bernard kicked a pint towards the end of that match into the, into the hill. And, uh, you know, they, they, they just weren't beaten. There was this kind of, they, they were going to go to the very end, Jar, and... You just got that feeling. I remember coming out with a ball at one stage, and I think it was Kevin Nolan that came against me. And and just the the the, 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 the tackling, I, I alluded to Bernard's tackling ability earlier. Just they were a different, they were a different animal. They were they were so strong in the tackle. Um, they were able to rip the ball. So so like, you know, you needed that kind of a how would I say? Tomas was quite good at it, breaking the line. Mm. You see Brian Driscoll doing it in the rugby. He was so good at it. You needed that type of a player to break the line. And Dublin had just had a, a wall and it was so hard to come out. And and uh, that was that was something that we hadn't seen from this Dublin team where they were just, they, they were a different animal that day and they kept going to the very end. The, the, the defensive structure is almost a response in, in to what happens in the Kerry game in 09 and the, the Mead game in some respects uh, the following year where they, they score five goals. That's the last time ever that a Dublin team has has been as open as that, maybe with the exception of the Nuni Gall game. We'll get to that later. But. Yeah. And Pat made a decision that um, we weren't going to get there, but he'd just been nice and just been co 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 cohorsing us into the defensive structure. He said, we need to really re look at this, um, how to become tough to beat first and then figure out how to win, you know. And um, it's well documented, the, the, the work that Pat put into um, 
making us work harder. Mark mentioned there about me chasing back. That's really, I, I rarely hear that, Mark. So thanks a million for um, for, for, for saying about my, my, my work rate because that was something that. Pat worked hard on something I worked hard on to be. I don't naturally have the best gas in the in, in the business, um, but I always tried to work hard. And later in my career, it was probably something I wouldn't have done in the in you know, eight or nine or seven. Whereas yeah, you chase, you, you do your best, but you're not. You, huh? Did it in sixteen as well in that national league final under the hill. I was coming out. I, I think you. I was going for a high one, and you. Uh, I was full sure I was going to catch it, and next thing this fella came behind me and he caught it and he offloaded. I think Jim McConnelly got a goal. It was absolutely sick. I tell you, I had some nightmares after that one. <laughs> no, those are great days, Mark. What are you talking about? Um, rarely, rarely happened. But yeah, that's we just we just had to come up with something different. Um, and we drew a line in the sand. I think the start of Airwigs is, the, is, is, is definitely a line in the sand. The work rate that, that we put in in the early season in, in 10. Um, Obviously, did, um, we learned a lot from the Mead game as well, shipping five goals, and those five goals were all down to our attention to detail. Every one of them, we had someone giving out to the ref or we had someone looking away. It was a really clear learning there after that. Um, and yet, we didn't quite get over the line in Cork. We were a bit unlucky. Um, we were actually moving well, and um, they, they just they were a good Cork team, and they were hunting for their, their, what they deserved, and they got over the line. Um, but after that, then I definitely think we had we had a steely resilience about our defensive structure, um, and still have, I suppose. We've got to let Mark go. Mark, thanks very much for um, for joining us. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, thank you, sir, and all, all the best with the book, Bernard. Thank you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I'm going to come back to some of those um, issues that you've raised about the tackling and tackling back, and, and that transformation of the team as well. A little bit later, when we, we've got Alan on the line as well. But um, your own personal relationship with Kerry is, is obviously well storied at this stage. Your ma is from Kerry um, by way of Belfast, it turns out in the book. Is that right? My granny is was Belfast, from Belfast yeah, right? Who um, her dad her her dad passed away. He worked in Harlan Wolf, and uh, the kids were shipped off around Ireland to the different. Um, uh, relations and my granny was sent down to Kerry to her aunt and uh, married James Jamesy, my granddad. And uh, yes, yeah, so my mum was reared in the stall in the main street, um, down from John B. Keynes and Kennelly's above that. And I think there was fifty bars in 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 uh, in, in the stall and a population of three thousand at the time or something <laughs> like that. Like I don't know how they used to flood in for the races, I suppose. But um, great, great town, great, great characters. Like you, you like just like. Big into the arts. My granny was big into the arts, and John B. So it's 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 like it's like a a play every time you go into the place. You go down to the pubs, and the and the characters telling stories at the bar and singing and saying poems and all that. It's a it's a beautiful place. Yeah, like that hinterland that you had then meant that there was an escape from the the pressure bubble of being a double footballer in the middle of all this. Or is that true? Like I don't know. It, because we, we we always heard a lot that there was a a lot of pressure on the dubs in the middle of uh, a season and. Anytime anybody would bump into anybody who was involved, there didn't seem to be that much. They all seemed to be quite well balanced and able yeah. to deal with us. We were, we were well protected, in fairness. Um, Seamus McCormack in the media, as you know, was, um, had us well, well, well drilled and, and it worked. You know, Jim was here, attention to detail, even Pat before him. They wanted to protect the players. Um, there was a big circus at times um, and we tried to protect ourselves from that as they stop reading papers around the games, don't be reading your reviews. I remember Paul Carrington talking to us and saying that even reading your, your positive reviews is more damaging than your negative ones. At least the negative ones, it gives you a bit of hurt and gives you a bit of drive. The positive reviews um, in, in, inflate you to a level where you just fall off a cliff, you know, that when, when things go wrong and somebody calls you out then. Um, I took a lot from that. Um, in my early days, like anyone, you kind of oh, you're looking for the the do they play well? What do you think? Or, you know, yeah. You're looking for that positive affirmation that things are going well. And I judge myself on did I score five points or seven points or one six? You know, I mean, on, sc on scores and, and and credit has been a success metric. Whereas as I got a bit more mature and um, understood the the dynamic of a team, basically about working hard and success being about working for the team, getting a turnover. Um, making up for someone else who slipped and, and, and trying to get a tackle in or laying off a goal or I loved I loved assisting a goal at, with back to goal at full forward and somebody on the burst like that I nearly got more joy out of that than putting the ball in the back of the net. It wasn't like that when you got into the Dublin team though. It wasn't like that from the Dublin team beforehand. You, you quote um, in the book Keith Barr saying his uh, three best friends when he was playing for Dublin were Keith Barr, Keith Barr, and Keith Barr, which is the most Keith Barr quote of all time. <laughs> 
<laughs> but like that was kind of there was a bit of that heritage still there even when you got into the team at the start like and that maturity wasn't just you there was a there was a bang of spice boys a little bit off that Dublin team they were going to play great football they were going to pull it up to everybody they'd be there for the scrap but ultimately at the end the opposition were going to be winning in the big games and yeah in some way um, and the players probably believed that it was self fulfilling um, prophecy that 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 kind of yeah we'll get out we'll win some games we'll, we'll head off in a beer for a couple of days and uh, and we'll be nearly men at the end and we'll have a, have a good year and we'll go again and we'll go away for a weekend to Spain for on the, on the beer and not that it was good beer or like that but it was just there was a little bit of that because the lifestyle wasn't about winning it was about I the lifestyle that, yeah yeah and it's about like as you say the not being protected in that bubble like buying into as you when you're walking down the street and someone's talking about the dubs and we're great stuff and you're flying it and stuff like that whereas um as the later we went on the more we were protected from that and we and we were we were communicated this this is not helping you, you know what i mean this is not like is are you here to get to an all around quarter final and go out on your ass and um and go play golf for a couple of days and drink a few pints. Like, is that why well, it's about to be Dublin? And a lot of the team, no one obviously wanted that, but when you actually look back at the, I mean, we tapped into our legacy and look at the 70s and look at how Dublin over the years, we've only had one All Ireland each decade up there with 83, with 95, coming into the, 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 the thousands then. Like, I mean, we, we, were, we were a failure as a Dublin team, do you know what I mean? And when we got it between the eyes a couple of times, you start to, you start to um, cop onto yourself a bit, you know? Um, so we, we had to learn the hard way in that way. And, um, we had great fun through, throughout the noughties. We had some great, great days. We, we, we had great characters on the pitch, um, great characters in the dressing room. Um, but as time went on, um, when definitely when Pat came in, he, he, he drew a line in the sand. And they say in the book there, the closer you were to the back of the bus, um, the more danger you were to be off the bus kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And where he wanted certain types of like, types of individual individuals that were... Uh, that were Gonna go for, go like a train through the wall for um for Dublin and act and, and behave in, in accordingly. Not that the lads weren't acting in, in, in a decent way, but um just things were changing. Yeah, well we'll get to the change in, in a little while. We're gonna take a quick break. We're talking with uh, Bernard Brogan. His book is called The Hill, and it's in all good bookshops now. OTB AM with Gillette. We don't just play the game; we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. <laughs> 